We're back with another episode of Room for Nuance. I'm Sean with my guest. Alisa Childers. Alisa. Yes. Not Alyssa. Not Alyssa. Not Alyssa. No. Have you ever heard anyone say your name properly the first try? Yes. The first try. Really? I have. And, and you know, it's oddly, usually like in stores when I'm paying and they see my name and they'll just say it right. And wow. I'll be like, how them. did you yeah. do that? Yeah. How did you know? <laughs> Well, uh, sister, we always get started with prayer. Would you mind praying as we get started? Absolutely. Right. Father, thank you so much for the freedom and opportunity to come together to have conversations that glorify your name and edify your church. That's our goal for today. Mm -hmm. We hope that that is accomplished. And uh, we pray that, that your will would be done in yeah. all the words that we speak and that would reach the people who need to hear it and minister to those who need it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, our viewers will note that we are in a different space, a different studio space. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the studio for the Room for Nuance podcast was located in my church building, which burned down last week. So now we are in another location, but the podcast continues. Can you start just by giving us like a five minute version of your testimony? Yeah. Yeah. So born and raised in a Christian home. I uh, nominally or sincerely, sincerely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really dedicated Christian parents. I personally was totally devoted to Jesus my whole life. Mm. I um, read almost the whole Bible by the time I was 12. It was very, very devout wow. in my faith in, in Jesus. And one of the mm. things I'm thankful to my parents for is they, they really did model what real Christians are like. Mm. And so um, you, know, you hear all these horror stories of people growing up with these horrible quote unquote Christians. And, um, I, I just, the Christians in my life were basically really great people that loved yeah. the Lord. They believed the Bible was God's word and they, they served other people. We would go out and do homeless ministry and street evangelism growing up, all kinds of stuff wow. like that. Um, so, so my faith wasn't blind. It was a very, uh, deep faith, mm -hmm. but what I didn't realize growing up is that, uh, it wasn't very informed intellectually. Mm. And so I had never heard words like hermeneutics. I grew up in the more kind of charismatic side of things. Yeah. So um, I, I knew a guy named Herman Newtix. Herman Newtix, yes. Yeah. Right. Good old Herman. <laughs> um, but I didn't know. I didn't know yeah. systematic theology. I didn't know any of those words. Or I, I just I realize now, looking back, actually, that I interpreted the Bible kind of allegorically. I didn't mm. realize I was doing that. Augustine would be proud. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, but I would, you know, I'd, whatever was going on in the Old Testament, for example, I would, I would just apply it to some spiritual battle I was having in yeah. my life. Cause I just didn't know, I didn't know that the historical context really yeah. mattered more than I believed it was real. I believed it really sure, happened, but sure. um, I just didn't have those tools. And so it wasn't until I was, I, I did some contemporary Christian music industry mm -hmm. stuff through the nineties. And then after I came off the road, my husband and I started attending a church right in the heart of the Bible Belt. We, I had, if I'm honest, really had lost touch with the local church. Mm. I, I loved Jesus, but um, I didn't really make it a priority to stay connected to mm -hmm. the local church while I was touring. Yeah. And that really made me vulnerable for what would happen next. But um, in this church that we loved, the pastor invited me to be a part of a smaller group study. And so I remember coming to the first class. There was about 12 people kind of all sitting around in a, in a circle like we are. Okay. And he said to this group, well, first he said, what we talk about in here kind of stays in here. We're Which not is not a good sign. To, yeah, I know. Yeah. And um, then he said he was an agnostic. Mm. And that blew my mind because, well, first of all, I didn't really know. I kind of knew what that was. I had a gymnastics coach yeah. that was agnostic when I was a kid and I brought him a gospel track thinking, you know, that'll cure that spiritual disease, whatever that wow. is. Um, but that's what he said he was. He said he was hopeful agnostic. And so at this time, I was confused by that, of course, red flags were flying, but I thought, well, I don't want to be judgmental. I'm going to hear him out. Maybe he just needs strength and support. And well, long story short, every core belief that I'd ever held about Jesus and God, the what Christianity is, the Bible, especially the Bible, these things were picked apart, explained away, they were deconstructed. And it really wasn't until we left the church. There, there was a night when they invited the spouses. For some reason, he had just invited me to this class. But then, and also not another good sign. Yes, I know. <laughs> Looking back, I'm like, I yeah. was kind of naive. <laughs> I about, was getting set up. Yeah, um, but I would go <laughs> home each week telling my husband, "You won't believe what they talked about this week." And then I'd spend the whole week researching that mm. question to try to refute what the pastor was saying. Okay. And 
when they invited the spouses, though, I remember we got in the car. My husband was really quiet, and he just goes, we're done. You're done. We're well, leaving. Praise God. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I praise God for that. So it was then when we left the church that I didn't really have anybody to debate with. And so all of those doubts took root mm. and really grew. And so it really propelled me into a faith crisis that mm. um, I didn't know if God existed at all. Mm. I was really double-minded. I, I didn't lose my faith. I don't want to over-exaggerate it, but I truly loved Jesus and truly didn't know if he actually existed. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like both of those things together. Yeah. So I just remember crying out to God one night and saying, God, if you're real, if the things that I've believed about you are true, I need to know that they're true. Yeah. And so God just sent me on this journey of studying apologetics and church history and theology and all the things, hermeneutics. So I got to meet Herman <laughs> at that point. Um, and then rebuilt my faith and made a lot of course corrections along yeah. the way. So there's, I've, you know, I disagree with my parents on some things theologically sure, now, sure. but um, I really am thankful to them for teaching me what mattered yeah. about the gospel, about the Bible being God's mm -hmm, word mm -hmm. and things like that. Wow. How long ago was that? So that was over 10 years ago. Yeah. Time flies. I bet it just feels like yesterday yeah, in some it sense, does. right? Yeah. yeah. Then uh, you've written some books. You've been involved with the American Gospel Projects. Uh, uh, sister, your apologetics ministry is absolutely invaluable. So I'm really excited for us to, to talk about this. But before we do, I went on to our Facebook page. That's about as much social media as I do. And I posted and I said, what must I absolutely ask Alyssa Childers about? But you, you kind of Oh, Elisa, dang, again. Eh, it's well, all right. We'll just keep going. It's okay. Yeah, it's going to happen again <laughs> for sure. Uh, and everyone said, uh, you have to ask about Zoe Girl. Now, listen, mm -hmm. you just kind of breezed right past it earlier. So we don't have to talk about it if you don't want to no, talk I'm, about I'm it. No, I'm happy to talk about okay, it. Okay, because I know how it can be with that. It's a part of your life. You're like, eh, I don't no, really care. No, it'd be fun. I don't really get to talk about it very often. Really? Yeah. I don't even know who or what a Zoe girl is. Oh, oh. So tell, tell me all about it. <laughs> yeah, much to learn. So this was back in 1999. And this was when, do you remember the Spice Girls? Uh, tell me what I want. Yeah. yeah what tell I really, what really you want. want. What you really, really want. Yeah. So the Spice Girls were just at the height of their fame. Okay. And so the Christian industry is like, we need a Christian Spice Girls. Wow. So at that time, I I had visions of being a singer-songwriter because that was really more my genre yeah. that I that I did. Um, but I was 25 at this point, feeling like I felt so old at 25. I felt like, oh man, I I, I have to- Gotta figure it out. Gotta, gotta get in this gotta thing. I'm there. almost a senior citizen. But, oh, you in know, the entertainment industry. In the entertainment yeah. industry, okay, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, so um, this opportunity came uh, to me to be a part of what they, they didn't say at the time that it was like Christian Spice Girls, but that it would be a, a, like a teen pop group that would be aimed at young girls, like Who tweens. Who is they? They are the powers that be, you know, the, yeah. the record label, the management. Actually, it was our manager and the record label that came together to put together Zoe Girl. So it really is like a, like a Christian music machine. Yeah, 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 it was. Okay. And and so what they what they wanted us to do is write songs that would um minister to young girls. And so Which is not bad. No, no, yeah. it's a it's a good goal. And I know, you know, I look back on it and I still hear stories from kids who are now, you know, they have their own kids, they're married with kids now, and they say, you know, your songs really helped me to mm. be bold for Jesus on my public school campus. And so yeah. I love hearing stuff like that. And that that's really encouraging. But so we, yeah, we were together for about seven or eight years okay. and uh, we got to tour. I got to do some really cool things yeah. while I was in Zoe Girl. I got yeah. to play at Madison Square Garden with Carmen. I think that was with Carmen. That Who's we Carmen? Did. Do you not know who Carmen, I don't know who Carmen is? Carmen oh, is. see, you have so much to. <laughs> okay, is that a Christian artist? So Carmen, so some of your audience right now is laughing because they know who Carmen okay, is, okay. and they're like, "This I is I didn't amazing. grow up in the church. Yeah, okay. I know who Jars of Clay are. Okay, okay. All so right. you didn't grow up. To, you have an excuse. So Carmen was like the big Christian artist in the '80s and '90s. Okay, and they kind of made this comeback in the early 2000s. A band. Carmen is one guy. One guy. It, the best way I could describe him is he was kind of like, he's he's not um, alive anymore, but he oh. was kind of like the Christian Tom Jones, like Las Vegas <laughs> oh, act. Okay. You know? like Luke, do you know who this is? Massive okay. shows, okay. you know, dancers, pyrotechnics, like the tour we did with him had pyrotechnics. Wow. So, so we played Madison Square Garden with him 
And I got to play the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. Um, got to tour with the Newsboys. I got to do one show with DC Talk when they were still <sighs> together. Yeah. Um, or do you know, are they still walking with the Lord? Um, well, that's a great question. Okay. So Toby, it, the kind of the main one that everybody Toby knows. Mac. Yeah, Toby okay. Mack yeah. is, is walking with the Lord. Praise God. Um, and Michael is walking with the Lord. Okay. Um, but Kevin has deconstructed. Hmm. And um, you so think his time in the music industry had a big part to play in that? You know, I, I don't know. It'd be hard for me to speculate because I don't really personally know Kevin very gotcha. well. I met him a time or two, but um, I, I asked because in your book, at the end, interestingly, I thought it would have been in the introduction. You talk about how some of your journey, at least trending towards deconstruction, was because of some of what you experienced oh, sure. in the Christian music yeah. industry. Yeah, it, it, yeah, without question. But at the same time, it's like there are so many artists that don't deconstruct and then there's sure. so many that do, but I definitely think there are factors there. But with Kevin, he, he went on Twitter, I think it was a couple of years ago and basically said that he's deconstructed and he's progressive now and he follows Richard mm. Rohr and the universal Christ yeah. and all of that. So, yeah. um, you know, for all intents and purposes, he's walked away, Yeah, but uh, the other two are walking yeah. with the Lord, so, to, to my knowledge. Uh, you still getting those royalty checks? Oh yeah. They're like, um, what are they like? 18 cents sometimes. <laughs> well, they actually stopped cutting checks for, right. I, I, did, I did get a royalty check for 18 cents once. Yeah. And I think we just framed it or something. I didn't even throw it away or yeah. use it. Yeah. That's um, so funny. But yeah, it's, we get, it's, it's very, they're very small yeah. now. Has, you know, we live in the age of, you know, uh, <laughs> our society is in decline. We can't come up with anything new. All we do is repurpose old thing mm. and make sequels and prequels. Has there been any mention of like a Zoe girl reunion tour? <laughs> we've actually, the three of us, so there's three of us in the group. Okay. Um, we've talked about it. In fact. Because you're um, all following the Lord. We're all walking with the Lord. Praise God. And we're all married with kids now. Okay. And actually about, I think it was maybe, I hate to say it was probably like 10 years ago. Yeah. We started talking about how each of us had written lullabies for each one of our children. Oh, wow. And wouldn't it be fun to come together and make a lullaby album? <laughs> Because all of our little Zoe girl fans yeah. are now moms and in that age group, so I can see it's it just now. never happened. But yeah. I, I mean, you're right by Nashville. Mm -hmm. Just find somebody. The Titus Two tour, right? You've become the there Titus Two women. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I bet you. I bet you. You pick like ten locations, ten dates. You'll sell out. It it's the only fun. thing people have asked about. They're like, "Tell us about Zoe girl." Wow. And I'm like, "Who is Zoe girl?" Yeah. But now I know. Yeah. All right. Uh, maybe after this is over, I'll show you a really embarrassing Christian rap video of me back when I used to. Oh, I'd love to see Yeah, that. it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, Luke. Luke is actually a real artist. Uh, he has just repurposed five hymns that are basically unsingable with their traditional melody. Mm. He's put them to a more modern melody. They're amazing. Oh, wow. Pretty cool, huh? That sounds awesome. Uh, hey, yeah. so... You got into apologetics. Do you still do music stuff? Like, do you serve musically in the church or is that kind of in the rear view? Well, it's coming back. Okay. So um, I served as sort of like on, as an artist in residence at a church for a few years, kind of during that faith crisis. And actually I'm so thankful for that church because the pastor, like I was really honest with him yeah. about my struggles and he helped kind of disciple us through that process of leaving that church. Praise um, God. So I served there for a few years, really up until COVID actually. Okay. Um, and then they kind of changed the way that they did things. And they used to have artists come in and, and help with the worship. And then they stopped doing that at okay. COVID. Uh, so from COVID until about a few months ago, I really wasn't doing much of any music okay. at all. But over the course of the last 10 years, really along this theological journey, I, I started to write songs again. And so mm. there were songs that I wrote when I was literally just coming out of the dark. Mm. Um, the one was, I, originally I called it a doubter's hymn because yeah. it was like me just singing by faith the truths that I knew were true, but I was my heart was trying to catch up with them. Wow. And uh, so I just got to record five songs that I've just released like in October. They're out. They're out. Yeah. Can you send me the link to that? I can. Okay, yeah. great. That's great. Uh, how, what's the reception been like so far? It's been great. I mean, we, it was yeah. kind of, it, it was a bit of a leap of faith because it's expensive yeah. to make music. And we used a live string section, which is very expensive. That's very expensive. <laughs> and, wow. um, but it was like, you know, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Yeah. Let's make something excellent and you know, and, and my goal was not, uh, I did not want to go through a label. I, I did not, I don't want to go through 
CCLI. I don't think it's right that churches should have to pay money to sing songs in their churches. Yeah. Um, so we're not doing any of that. So it's okay. just totally independent. So, but I'm I'm really thrilled. The reception's been yeah. great. We've pretty much broken even. So I'm thrilled about that. that you That's know, huge. That if you huge. really spent that much money on yeah. it, yeah, yeah. So especially I'm, in the age where people don't make money off of selling music anymore, right? It's all like downstream. You don't really right. make any money off the album. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I'm I'm really I'm really it's been satisfying. So that's that's been increasing like invitations to go to churches. Yeah. And so sometimes now I'll sing a song when I, yeah. you know, like speak at a women's conference or something and yeah. do that. Why do you think churches should not use CCLI? Well, it's, so I remember, this is my personal opinion yeah. and I, I could be wrong, but I remember back when that all became a thing. Okay. And I remember my publisher, this was when I was signed to, I think it was EMI at the time. Okay. And is that remember, a big label? Um, yeah. So it was Sparrow Records. They got bought by EMI, which is okay. a, a secular company. Okay. All, pretty most of the labels now are owned by secular companies. Mm, just like the so, publishing houses. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, it's similar. So I think Capital owns our catalog now. So it's it's gone through, you know, some changes, but yeah. it was EMI at the time. And I remember our publisher saying, you know, when you write worship songs, one of the ways that you'll make money is, is that when churches actually sing them in their services, mm -hmm. they're going to pay a royalty. And I looked at him and I said, that's, that's wrong. Mm. It's one thing to produce, you know, a project that people pay for the music. That's one thing because that costs you something to make. But just for churches to have to pay a royalty to worship, mm. just it hits me really wrong. And yeah. so I didn't want to do that. That was um, certainly the way I reacted the first time I heard about yeah. it as well. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, because technically, even if a church isn't using, I think this is right, I may be wrong about this, isn't even using the CCLI software, they're still supposed to report mm -hmm. what songs they're singing to, right. to pay the royalty. Yeah. This is, hits me in all kinds of wrong ways. Can you imagine the IRS <laughs> kicking down your door? You owe us $700 yeah. for It Is for Well. For singing It Is Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, we got to start talking about deconstruction. I have so many questions. Uh, sometimes when I do interviews, I'll read people's books and uh, I'll just be like, yeah, we'll talk about something else. But your book is just full of quotations. I did my best to try to narrow everything down to make this a, a streamlined discussion, but uh, the whole manuscript could have just been underlined and, and highlighted. Oh, I thought you. it was very useful. It, very well written um, with Tim. What's Tim's last name? Tim Barnett. Tim Barnett of? Red Pen Logic. Red Pen yeah. Logic. He's got those fantastic YouTube videos yes. and those shorts. I, I mostly just see the shorts, but anytime I see them, I'm edified by them. Yeah. So hopefully we can get him on the show. He's doing great work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, before you wrote this book, uh, you say... Uh, sorry, actually, let's let's go back even before that. Let's talk about your heart in addressing this. Mm. Uh, Russell Berger and I, we do an apologetics podcast kind of sometimes when we have enough time. When we did our series on critical theory, which is not just critical race theory, but all of that, it was such a... Um, passions were so inflamed about that subject that the very first episode we did was to talk about our heart in addressing that subject because yeah. we were going to say some some pretty tough things we wanted people to know that it was in love that we were praying for fruit of the spirit as we were doing it etc and that's how you and tim start off the book you say uh we feel like we are writing with both tears in our eyes and a sword in our hand can you elaborate on that yeah well one comparison i could make is when there's some sort of a like a pandemic you want to fight that disease because you care about the people who could be hurt by it. Mm -hmm. So you have tears in your eyes for the people who might be harmed by it. Yeah. But you're going to throw everything you have at curing it, stopping it, you know, that kind of thing. So I think deconstruction is kind of like that disease. Okay. That you're going to throw, you're going to pull out your sword and do everything you can do to stop it from robbing people of their faith. Yeah. But at the same time, you have tears in your eyes for the people who are so confused yeah. by the deconstructionists online and the propaganda machine that the social media mm -hmm. space is. Yeah. So I think that was that was really kind of what we meant. And it also, that was springboarded off of some pushback we would get when we would talk, when we would talk in war language. So this was, um, we kind of start the book with this now viral statement that skillet frontman John Cooper made at Winter Jam when he mm -hmm. said it's time to declare war on the idolatrous 
deconstructed Christian movement. Mm -hmm. And what I think that revealed at the time was that Christians were defining deconstruction in really different ways. Mm -hmm. Because for those of us who understood it like John understood it, as this thing that robs your faith, Mm -hmm. we were like, yes, John, you know, that's great. But then for people who were defining it just as simply engaging your doubts Mm -hmm. or asking hard questions, they were like, why are you so mad at me? I'm I'm asking questions. I want to know what's true. So I think that's where we were trying to explain, like, we're not mad at people who are confused. We're mad at the lie. Yeah. You're like a a surgeon who's aggressively removing any signs of cancer. That's right. You're not doing it to hurt the patient. You're doing it because you want to help the patient. Right. If you cut somebody's chest open and you're not a doctor and there's no purpose, then (laughs) you're harming that person. But if you're a doctor and you have a scalpel and you're trying to remove disease, then it's it's still the same instrument, Mm -hmm. but it's used for good or evil. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. So uh, in that little... um, you were talking about the different ways that people use the word deconstruction. Here's a quote from right at the beginning of the book. You say, when terms are not clearly understood, we can end up talking past one another. You and I were talking about the good faith debate that I did with Rebecca McLaughlin about wokeness, uh, really disappointed in how that turned out because it, not until halfway into the second part of the debate, do we realize that we're just not even using this word in the same way, mm. you know? So when terms are not clearly understood, we can end up talking past one another. Multiple meanings create confusion, especially when it comes to a word as emotionally charged as deconstruction. So right at the outset of this interview, as we begin to explore this topic, can you just give us a good succinct definition of deconstruction? Yes. And and I will tell you that this definition was the hardest sentence for Tim and I to write in the whole book, just to try to pin it down. And I will also tell you that one of the reasons we wanted to be so careful to define it so succinctly is because we saw so many well-meaning Christian leaders using it in all kinds of different ways, which is really confusing. So our definition, and we can dig down into some of this if you want to, is it's a postmodern process Mm -hmm. of rethinking your faith, but not regarding scripture as a standard. You nailed it. That's exactly what I have yeah. directly word for word from you. You, you really did I'm write memorized. this book. <laughs> no ghostwriters. You no. really wrote this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So we're going to basically spend the rest of the interview unpacking that. Let's contrast your definition with a definition that Josh Harris, the, mm-hmm. the author of I Kissed Dating Goodbye, yeah. Or How I, yeah, who has deconstructed. Mm-hmm. He is one of the more honest deconstructors. He says there's a biblical phrase for the word deconstruction, and it's called falling away. What does he mean by that? Yeah, well, this was in 2019. So Josh Harris was like this icon of purity culture in the 90s. And he basically announced that he was getting a divorce. And then a couple of weeks later, he went on Instagram. And that, that's where that comes from, is he was saying, uh, I've deconstructed the for all intents and purposes, I'm not a Christian anymore. Yeah. And the biblical phrase is falling away. So we pointed that out because back in 2019, there were not a lot of people challenging that definition. Most yeah. people were like, yeah, deconstruction means walking away or deconversion was yeah. synonymous. Yeah. And then after that, there seemed to be a whole bunch of Christians really more in the evangelical world saying, oh no, just deconstruct, but deconstruct in a healthy way. So, so then an example of that would be Lecrae. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When he said, I'm deconstructing, he had this long series of tweets, which really he was just saying, I'm reexamining my faith to make sure it's biblical. Right. And, and so we would say, yeah. everybody should reexamine, you know, every mm-hmm. day, always mm-hmm. examine, make mm-hmm. sure your beliefs line up with scripture, make sure they line up with what's real and true. Um, but we're saying that's not deconstruction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting because when you wrote your first book, Another Gospel, yeah. you used the phrase deconstruction. Can you talk about that? I changed it. Yeah, I've changed my mind. Yeah. So well, Did somebody come to you and say, Sister, I don't think this is helpful, or was it you just working through it? It was me working through it. Okay. Um, so basically, in my first book, Another Gospel, which is sort of my theological memoir of where I walk the reader through that process I described at the beginning of our okay. interview where I was talking about my doubt and all of that. And at the time, I called that deconstruction. Even in the book, I I called it deconstruction because it was the best word I had at the time. But what started to happen is when I started to talk more about deconstruction, progressive Christians who had already been through deconstruction and Mm -hmm. other deconstructionists would say, you don't understand deconstruction. Mm. And 
I was like, well, I'm pretty sure I do. I almost lost my faith, you know? And they would say, no, you, you didn't deconstruct because you still believe mm -hmm. all the things Christians believe, yeah. you know? Well, they would say evangelicals, but sometimes they conflate the two. But, um, and, and so I would say, okay, so because I busted everything down to the studs, I mean, you, these people had no idea how many beliefs I actually changed, yeah, yeah. but because I believe Jesus is my savior, that I'm a sinner, that his the blood, Bible's infallible, atoning yeah. sacrifice on the cross, that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead, hell is real, because yeah. I believe those yeah. things, I didn't deconstruct. Hmm. So that got me thinking, like, this word means something different mm -hmm. as it manifests in culture than, mm -hmm. than way, maybe some the way some people in church are using yeah. it. Or even historically the way the, right. the, the word was intended to be used. Right, exactly. Which and you get so, into the book. That's yeah. right. So then I started thinking about the postmodern baggage behind the word. Mm -hmm. And then I started to ask myself, why did I use a postmodern word? to describe what really I think was a process of seeking truth mm -hmm. and following the truth wherever it leads. Yeah. Why am I using a postmodern word that is built upon the rejection of absolute truth? Why yeah. would I do that? Yeah. And I hung on to it for a while. And um, because I do think even in my faith crisis, I, I subtly bought into some of the lies of postmodernism, mm -hmm. not realizing it until yeah. I pulled back out of it. But it was, when we wrote this book, it became so clear to me, I did not deconstruct. That yeah. is absolutely not what happened. I doubted, I nearly maybe lost my faith. I don't think I could have, but right. nearly felt like I did. Yeah. Um, I reevaluated absolutely everything uh -huh. I believe about everything, uh -huh. but that's not deconstruction. That is yeah. not what I did because what is manifesting in the deconstruction space, which is, it's largely happening online mm -hmm. because people leave their church communities. They leave even sometimes write no contact letters. Then they find community online, which mm -hmm. is basically a propaganda machine. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they will tell you if they laugh. I mean, they, they have memes, meme after meme after meme laughing at Christian pastors who say, oh, just deconstruct with the Bible in one hand. Yeah. And they're like, that's not what this is. Yeah, You're not supposed to have an external authority when you deconstruct. Yeah. That's right. Well, you say that there are a number of different reasons why the word deconstruction should not be baptized, which is a great image, uh, redeemed or Christianized to mean something healthy or positive. But the main uh, reason you give is that uh, what pastors call good deconstruction, which we would say using the scriptures to challenge the ideas and beliefs you hold, it's just not the commonly, it's not the common use of the word. 90% of the people, 95% of the people, uh, when they use that word, they don't mean reanalyzing your beliefs in light of scripture. They mean trying to tear down your beliefs and move away from scripture. Yeah. You list other reasons, but I think that's probably the most And belief in one. general, you know, in yeah. that deconstruction yeah. space, they don't want you to land on any kind of belief because if you do, you'll just have to deconstruct that. Yeah. And then you talk about, well, well, what if we add an adjective to it? If we add the right adjective to it, then that will... Uh, be like healthy deconstruction versus unhealthy deconstruction. And you say that that won't help the problem either. No, we, we yeah. tried actually, Tim and I, okay. when, when we were first talking about writing the book, that's when the John Cooper thing happened. And that's when we realized, oh, there's a hundred different ways people mm -hmm. are talking about this. Maybe we could talk about like a healthy. So we tried, we couldn't do it. We couldn't find the healthy yeah. deconstruct. You, well, we, you go in the hashtag, you go in the, in the spaces where people are talking about it. Yeah. You cannot find this healthy deconstruction. Okay, so what word should we use? Should well, it be a word? Should it be a sentence? We we advocate for the word reformation. And yeah. I don't honestly care what you sure. call it. You sure. can call it discernment. You can call it yeah. discipleship. Yeah. You can call it um, being a biblical Christian. Yeah. Um, we say reformation is good because you do want to always be reforming your beliefs according yeah. to scripture with the yeah. cry of the reformation. But um, well, even that prefix is something that you talk about in the book. You say there's a difference between D words and yes. re words. Yes, D words tear down, mm -hmm. deconstruct, D you know, evolve, yeah. de, whatever, but yeah. recreate, reform, re, these are words that are building up and yeah. we want to build up right belief, not just tear down for the sake of tearing down. Yeah. Yeah. Every Christian, if you live long enough, I mean, maybe you get saved and you get into a car accident on the way home. I don't know, but most of us will go through some period of reformation, yeah. right? That's just a normal simper reformanda. Uh, sometimes it's major. Like when I came out of the prosperity gospel, uh, sometimes it's minor when you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm a continuationist anymore, but I'm going to dig into that when I get a little more time. But mm -hmm. we are always in some sense, just reevaluating our beliefs in light of scripture. Yeah. And yeah, I like the word discernment. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's just a good biblical word. Reformation, good too, but 
Yeah, discernment's a good word. Yeah. Yeah, that has my vote. Yeah. Uh, in chapter 12, you give some pretty good advice on how to interact with Christians who perhaps use the word unwisely. You guys do a little thought experiment, which I really like. You say, uh, Johnny, little Johnny, <laughs> Johnny, little Johnny comes home from youth camp and announces to his Christian parents that he is in dis- uh, deconstruction. And his parents say, thanks for sharing that with us. Which, by the way, I love how perfect this response is. I'm trying to think if my daughters came home from Christian camp and said, <laughs> we're deconstructing. <laughs> they got like a nose ring and yeah, green hair. Like, Would I be like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <me>. wow. <laughs> Probably not. I'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Uh, you say, thanks for sharing that with us. What do you mean by deconstruction? Well, which is a good practice, right? Ask people what they mean. When someone uses the word woke, well, what do you mean by that? When someone uses the word prosperity, what do you mean by that? Uh, What do you mean by construction? Well, it turns out Johnny heard from some friends that deconstruction is a way of making sure you believe what's true. For him, it's a healthy process of thinking through what he's been taught and making his faith his own. And then you say, uh, once you've kind of understood that, wrapped your arms around how he's using the word, then later you want to come back and gently nudge him. Hey, maybe there's a better word. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really wise. Yeah. Well, the reason yeah. we used that specific scenario is because that's that specific scenario has happened many times when I speak to youth. So oh. I do some um, youth apologetics with like Summit Ministries and Impact 360. Okay. And when we talk about deconstruction, what I learn is that especially among that age group, that kind of middle school and high school age group, yeah. they a lot of the Christian kids have adopted the language of some of their evangelical leaders who have tried to baptize the word. Mm. And so I've had kid after kid, after I give my presentation, come up to me and go, you know, I, I, w- I thought that I was deconstructing, but now I realize I'm not deconstructing. I'm just trying to make my faith my own. I'm trying to yeah. you know, evaluate scripture. I'm trying to learn how to read and study the Bible for myself. Um, and I was calling that deconstruction, but I'm not going to call it that yeah. anymore. So I, I think I've seen the fruit of that conversation yeah. many times, especially when you actually show them what mm-hmm. is the dominant mm-hmm. expression of the word when yeah. they get out from under the safety of their Christian homes and yeah. limited you know, social media or whatever they have, yeah. when they really see what it's like. And I show them in, yeah. the, you know, in the talk and they're like, oh no, that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. So That's really I, useful. Yeah, it happens now, a lot. And you keep uh, bringing up, uh, and I'm glad you, you do, the the, the world of uh, deconstruction online. We're going to talk about that pretty heavily towards the end of the interview because uh, people are basically falling into two worlds, either a healthy local church or really unhealthy online communities. Yeah. So we're going to come back to that. Uh, you, you guys talk about the five key elements of most deconstruction. Uh, which I also just like the word deconversion. Mm. Uh, even that's the, a little theologically fraught because a truly regenerate heart can't become unregenerate. But yeah, you say there's uh, people who deconstruct, they have a problem with a literal, literal reading of the Bible, a belief that women are be, to be submissive to men, a belief in the sanctity of heterosexuality, the assumption that the American way of life is best, and identification and partnership with political and social conservatism. Now, what I found to be interesting about this is that at least three of these points, there's a way in which you could say that in which I think we would say, amen. Mm-hmm. So let's start with the first one. Yeah. A literal reading of the Bible. Yeah. Contra Ken Ham. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not <laughs> trying to start any beef with Ken Ham. Uh, you interpret the parts of the Bible literally that are meant to be understood literally, and you yeah. interpret the poetry poetically, and you interpret the uh, allegory allegorically. There's not a lot of allegory, but there is some. Yeah. And so, I mean, isn't that a a good place for you to get in with people who are deconstructing to be, to, for you to say, actually, well, I don't know that I believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible either. Yeah. I think that could be a good doorway because I, and there's so much straw manning that happens, especially with this topic in particular, because deconstructionists are some of the most wooden literalists that you'll mm, ever meet mm-hmm. when it comes to what they want to refute from the Bible. They have no hermeneutical precision. No, yeah, it, no they nuance. take everything, like mm-hmm. they will take everything wooden, literal, yeah. and then try to debunk the Bible because, oh, the Bible says something stupid, like whatever they think is stupid, right? Yeah. And so it's interesting that they criticize, you know, literalists when they're like such literalists. That's such but a good point. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that was one of the things when I was coming out of my faith crisis that, I really learned about, hey, the Bible employs figures of speech just like we do in yeah. everyday language and yeah. learning to spot what they are. The problem, though, I think, is that sometimes people who accuse 
Christians of literalism, they want to turn plain speech into figures of speech. Yeah. And and you can't you can't allegorize everything, you yeah. know. It has to, you have to go with the intent of the author. Was right. the author intending to communicate like a parable, for example? Yeah. You know, Jesus was telling stories that make a spiritual point, right? And so it's yeah, I think Jesus that, is not literally a door. He's not a door. Not a door. He doesn't have hinges. <laughs> he's not made of wood, you yeah. know. And um and sheep, you know, I don't I don't have a woolly coat and yeah. you know. So That's it's right. yeah, it, it some of it is um is a straw man, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the next one, a belief that women are to be submissive to men. That is biblical, uh, but I can imagine the way that they understand that is not what the Bible intends right. when it uses that language. Right. In fact, in most... So this... Um, I don't know how deep in the weeds we want to go on this, but the, you know, there's a debate among Christians about... And there's a, a bit of a spectrum, complementarian to egalitarian, that people are going to land on different places sure. in the spectrum. You can be a Christian and be egalitarian. You can, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would... Probably shouldn't be. I would disagree <laughs> yeah. with an egalitarian. But, um, but yeah, we can have that debate based on yeah. scripture. I know a couple of really great egalitarian scholars even that I've had on my podcast mm -hmm. that I disagree with them on okay. that topic. But they, they are to the best of my knowledge, trying to get their position out of scripture, yeah, right? right? So that's a different conversation than what's yeah. going on in the deconstruction hashtag. Right. So what's happening there is it's really, I think, built upon a more, you know, if you want to use the word woke, yeah. definition of justice, which is equal outcome. Mm -hmm. So if a woman has a different outcome than a man does in mm -hmm. church leadership, that's not just a theological debate, that's actually oppression. Mm -hmm. That's injustice. Yeah, the Marxist worldview, everyone is either an oppressor That's or right. the oppressed. So, yeah. so and and I've had, sorry, but middle-aged white guys mansplain to me mm -hmm. that I am internally oppressed yeah. <laughs> for holding that view, which is hilarious, hilarious to me. Yeah, the irony. But um, but so it's a, it's an injustice. And so, and then what also ends up happening is you might have somebody who's come out of a real extreme version. Um, of like a, a real hyper fundamentalist, yeah, like IFB where stuff, IFB, yeah. where women are basically hated, and it, you know, I, I would say that there is some misogyny yeah. going on there, and they'll they'll say, well, this is what all evangelicals believe. Mm -hmm. This is what this is what the church teaches, whatever yeah. their particular experience was. Yeah. So that gets thrown in there, and then also like people like Beth Allison Barr, who are basically, and you know, she Kristen was, Dumez. yeah, Kristen yeah. Dumez. She like they uh, Beth Allison Barr in her book, she even says that she skirted the fringes of the Gothard movement. Yeah. And she's equating that to, okay, well, all evangelicals must believe that. Huh. And then she's linking that to abuse. Yeah. So she says, yes, complementarianism as a theology leads to abuse. Wow. So in the mind of the deconstructionist, and this is, this is really where the postmodernism comes in on just all sorts of different topics. But the, you know, if we define deconstruction as not regarding scripture as a standard, what their standard is, is really what they personally mm -hmm. feel helped by or harmed by, abused or, you know, they're going to reject what they feel abused by and embrace what they feel affirmed by. Yeah. And so it's all this, this shift of authority from an external authority to an internal one. Yeah. And so complementarianism, wherever you land on it, for them, it, that is an abusive doctrine. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter how careful you are. Right. Yeah. How nuanced the language is. Yeah. The third thing is a belief in the sanctity of heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, why does that ruffle their feathers? Well, that's a big one. I would say that that's kind of a pillar in the deconstruction movement is that they believe, again, getting to the unequal outcome and the perceived oppression mm -hmm. is that the church oppresses gay people. That's, that's the view. Yeah. And so if we were to say marriage is between a man and a woman, mm -hmm. well, that is that's oppressing mm -hmm. somebody who might experience some level of same sex attraction mm -hmm. because they've embraced that as a, as a core identity. Yeah. You know, that's obviously from Freud saying our sexuality is our core identity. We bought that hook, line and sinker. And yeah. so of course the deconstructionists have bought that. Yeah. So if somebody experiences a particular temptation in that area, that is their core identity. And then if the church doesn't affirm that, then the church is basically saying you can't, you know, be a part of, of us and we yeah. reject you which of course is not, is not true, you know, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the perceived oppression. Yeah. The fourth is the assumption that the American way of life is best. 
uh, I don't know any Christian. No, nah, maybe there would be some Christians who would say that. I think I would almost say that, just depending on what you mean. Yeah. I think Western civilization is downstream from a, a deep reservoir of a biblical worldview. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no culture is perfect or right. sinless. Nobody should ever use superlative language towards any fallen kingdom on this earth. Uh, yeah. So what would you say to a... Well, it's it's almost like... You know, because this language, I think that what you're reading is coming from Blake Chastain, who came up with the evangelical hashtag. That's okay. what he was saying. <clears throat> like, these are the pillars of evangelicalism yeah. we're leaving, basically. Yeah. And um, so when when you talk about American way of life is best, that's how he worded it. Okay. But really, if we're honest, if you just like America, <laughs> yeah. they think you're a Christian. You don't have to be a MAGA. Loving, you don't even have yeah. to be like yeah. saying that the American way yeah. of life is best. You just have to be like, I love my country. Yeah. Christian nationalist. You're you're yeah. you traded politics for the gospel. And wow. You know, so I think there's these people should go live in another country for a little while. Well, and that's the thing. And the, one of the things we say in the book is first of all, my co-author is Canadian. So <laughs> like we're not saying we're not saying that. Yeah. But um, he knows his country sucks though, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, he knows that. I think he put a line in there like everybody knows Canada's the best, Gr- right? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think it, there's more going on there. It's okay. this um perceived idea that evangelicals are you know, that evangelical is synonymous with Republican or MAGA or something right. like that. And, yeah. and um, there's no room for nuance in that Ooh, conversation. Again, like all right, we're going to do a compilation <laughs> video because every episode somebody does somebody it at does least that. once. Let's go. Uh, number five, identification and partnership with political and social conservatism. And there's just no way you can win on that one, right? I right. mean, uh, I think it was G.K. Chesterton who defined conservatism like this. He says, when you you are out walking in a field and you see a fence, rather than saying, let's tear it down, you first must stop and say, I wonder what that fence is there for, right? Now, I butchered that, but... No, that was it. That was was at least a close paraphrase. Close enough, right? Yeah, Yeah, the the message version of the word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think that that's a good biblical instinct. I know that iterations of conservatism can certainly be unbiblical, but going back to the same impulse with the American way of life, there's really no way that you can shape that or mold it or say it that they will in any way be able to hear it, right? No, I don't think so. And this is the thing. Well, let me say this and then I'll get into the hypocrisy of of that as well. Um, Yeah, of course, like we, we quote Doug uh, Groitais, a great Christian philosopher on conservatism. And, and yeah, I think you're right. I think now every, like you said, there's every kingdom on earth is fallen, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are, there's no perfect political party, right? But really what that's about is the 2020 election. Mm. Um, In almost every deconstruction story, Donald Trump is in there somewhere. Yeah. And so what I think is going on is that they what you'll hear a lot in the deconstruction stories is, hey, Christians were so hard on Clinton, they wouldn't let him pass morally. They said, you know, you're you're immoral, so you got to get out. We're, we're done with you. But yet they, they embrace Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's a very broad statement because not every Christian broad. does embrace Donald right. Trump. Some voted for him because it was the lesser of two evils mm-hmm. in their mind, or they yeah. um, they liked his policies. And they were, it, there was a just, again, I, yeah. it's not to bring in nuance, but there was there's like no nuance in this conversation yeah. at all. Right. And so anybody who may be voted for Trump or is a Republican is kind of lumped in with this idolatrous political yeah. movement. Right. And, and to be fair, that there is a real that idolatrous political movement and out there. And it does yeah. exist. I've met them. Yes. It's a real wild ride having yes. those conversations. Well, and especially like with what the American gospel movies are doing that we've been involved in. Yeah. We, we've seen that, especially yeah. in the new apostolic reformation. There's a lot of that. So wild. yeah, we're not denying yeah. that there are Christians that are doing that for but sure. You just can't collapse every Christian. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so I think that's what's going on there. But I mentioned the hypocrisy and I just, I did want to just mention this because, yeah. you know, in the whole Christian nationalism conversation, some, according to the definitions that everybody's going by, some of the most, you know, Christian nationalistic churches are progressive churches who regularly have, you know, Democratic candidates come and give stump speeches in their chant. churches. Then, then wasn't there a video of that just recently? With yeah, Biden? there was, yeah. A, there was one recently. And so, you know, it, it's, it goes both ways <laughs> it there. It really does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, I, I think about that kind of like the ring, like both sides are trying to 
get their ring of power. Mm. Sometimes they're doing it from a politically conservative position. Sometimes they're doing it from a politically progressive position. But that's the carnal desire underneath it all. And sometimes it's wrapped in religious garb, you mm. know. Yeah. Uh now, it's, I find it interesting. Who is the person who wrote these five? Um, uh, well, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. Blake Chastain yeah. was the guy who came up with the ex-evangelical hashtag, okay. and he has the ex-evangelical podcast now. Okay. And when somebody asked him, what does ex-evangelical mean? He said, well, it's, it, you these, know, yeah. it, this might change and grow as I, as I go, but this is kind of what yeah. we are leaving. To well, I think it's interesting that he doesn't list race in here because if, yeah. it seems like race is like a huge one, especially after 2020. Well, I'd have to look at when he wrote that blog post because yeah. it might have been before the whole George Floyd yeah. thing, before that really was at the forefront of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, I I cannot tell you. So I was um, in the Christian rap world for a little while. A lot of my, for a long I went through my own little weird identity crisis. I grew up around nothing but like Mexicans, Filipinos, and black kids growing up. And then I joined the military, moved away, lived in Seattle, the whitest city maybe in the world. <laughs> and uh, and then I moved to Atlanta, which, you know, maybe the blackest city in the world. And uh, had a lot of uh, black friends there, black Christian friends. And I got to say, I think over half of them are not walking with the Lord anymore. Hmm. And most of that has happened over the last four or five years. It started kind of in 2011. Yeah. By God's grace, a lot of brothers have persevered. We don't always agree on race stuff when we have the conversation, but praise God we can have the conversation sometimes. Uh, but yeah, race stuff has really caused... Uh, it, I don't know what the hashtag would be. If the broad kind of hashtag is exvangelical, there's kind of, uh, what is it? Leaving loudly, Leave, Jamar yeah. Tisby's whole thing. Yeah. Uh, that was pretty bad. The idea was very similar to this deconstruction idea. It's we're not walking away from Jesus. We're just trying to shed the the, the white manifestations yeah. of, of Christianity that are unbiblical. But I don't know a lot of guys who survived that, yeah. you know? So yeah, well, and that's enmeshed. Like the whole critical theory is totally yeah. enmeshed in deconstruction. Yeah, yeah. Like decolonize your theology. There's a mm -hmm. influencer uh, in the deconstruction space that basically said that you have not deconstructed until you've decolonized your theology. And yeah. by decolonize, she means get rid of blood atonement, get rid of biblical authority. All of these yeah. are uh, tools of oppression that the church has used yeah. to control people with fear and to prop up white supremacy. That's yeah. kind of the, the yeah. narrative. Yeah. Even if 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 um if being punctual is is a manifestation of whiteness, then atonement's not going to make yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and know? logic and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, two plus two equals four. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You say that the one thing that virtually all deconstruction stories have in common is what they say they're leaving behind, right? So uh, they they express an almost... Well, actually, sorry, an answer that first. I got carried away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it might be helpful to think of deconstruction like a car. It's a car you get in to leave a, a point. Okay. But you can go anywhere. You can end up in agnosticism, you can end up in secular humanism, you can end up surrounded by crystals and chanting, you know, aff affirmations, you can end up a progressive Christian. Yeah. Um, and that's why I actually think deconstruction is the biggest apologetic challenge we have right now, because it truly doesn't matter where you go, as long as you leave these quote unquote toxic theological beliefs. Yeah. And really the toxic theological beliefs are any sort of objective truth statement that you mm. might make because yeah. that's an external authority, which is, is seen as a power grab. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I couldn't help as I was reading this, think of another illustration for the difference between deconstruction and reformation. Uh, when our church burned, uh, cause one of the things that they, it's hard to burn brick. It's a brick building. Mm. Brick is hard to burn. That's one of the reasons why people use it. Uh, there's there's a structural engineer who is there this week who's trying to determine if the damage is significant enough to just tear it all down or do you just kind of scrape all the crap out of the inside and then rebuild from within and i think that's a pretty good picture right mm -hmm. a lot of deconstructionists they don't care they're just trying to tear it all down they they start like satan with a little bit like a half mm -hmm. of a truth but then the, the goal is to tear the whole building down Whereas reformation is, all right, if the bones are sturdy and we want the bones to be sturdy, yeah. let's get back in there and rebuild and it's going to be better than before. Yeah. And yeah. you want to have a shelter, right? That's the mind of the reformation is, is the house is good. Yeah. It's good to have a roof over your head. Yeah. And interesting with the house analogy, because I don't think this actually made it into the book. We had to chop like 
yeah. I don't know, 10 or 20,000 words. It was crazy. We it's had written bummer. so much. We had yeah. to cut so much out. But, but um, you know what? It paid off though, because the book, the pacing good. is very good. Good, good. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that didn't make it in the book is um, one of the deconstructionists online uses the house analogy. And it's so interesting to oh. hear him talk about uh, how he sees deconstruction like a house. And okay. basically he says, oh, you know, you want to turn this big room or you want to knock this wall down and turn that into, into two rooms. But you know what? It's, it's a load bearing wall. Now the roof is sagging. So now you just have to tear the whole thing down. Uh, and I'm like, did, does he even realize wow. what he's saying? You can't just knock down any wall. Yeah. If you want a good house, if you want a house that's yeah. going to stand and, you know, shelter you, yeah. you can't just go down knocking walls because you want a room there. It doesn't Ato work that way. Atonement is a load bearing wall. Yeah. You can't knock that you, down. You, can't, yeah. you don't get to just do that and still have a house. And so it was interesting to me that he would use the house analogy, but even basically out himself as saying, well, yeah, yeah I just have to, same with the sweater analogy. I think it was Lisa Gunger that used that analogy. Yeah. And she's like, you pull at this thread because it's itchy. You don't uh -huh. like it. So uh -huh. you pull on it. And I thought that was interesting language too, because yeah. it's like, she's not worried about the structure of the sweater. She yeah. just doesn't want that thing right there. Didn't like it. And then she's like, and then you don't have a sweater anymore. I'm like, well, yeah, you and don't. And you're left naked. And you're left no, naked. No That's cover. right. That's exactly what she says. <laughs> yes. uh, so speaking of Lisa Gungor, Gunger, Gunger, Alisa, Alyssa, tomato, potato. <laughs> uh, all these quotes that you have in the book, they are still zealous evangelists. Oh, yeah. Uh, you say that they express an almost religious zeal to reconvert others. They are actively attempting, I'm combining two quotes here, actively attempting to dismantle historic Christianity, discredit the church, and promote an atmosphere of faith deconstruction. We're, we're fond of telling our people when we talk about apologetics and evangelism is that everyone is preaching. Everyone is an evangelist. I got back from Portland a couple months ago, the, one of the most secular cities in the country, could not believe how much preaching there was. Every window, Black Lives Matter. In this house, we believe X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Marches and, and literal street preachers, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I just find it interesting that although they've abandoned Christianity, that impulse to evangelize, uh, to bring people into the faith still exists. Oh, it's very strong. In fact, yeah. we talk about in the book how Josh Harris, who we mentioned before, uh, he came out with what he called a deconstruction starter pack. And for $275, you could take these classes oh, from him where he could deconstruct. This guy's a marketing your faith. machine. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is you, you, there are deconstruction coaches online, there yeah. are deconstruction therapists, there's all sorts of people who it's are an industry. happy to take your yeah. money to, to deconstruct your faith for you. Yeah, I noticed that that, that, that uh, the package he's selling, that's not. It's not for free. He's not really. Well, so in all fairness to him, okay. which I don't, I shouldn't laugh at this, but it, it's a little bit funny that he said, I'll give this package for free to anybody who was harmed by my previous purity culture teachings. Uh, so I think it, by the time he took it down, because there was yeah. a big backlash, not from conservatives, but from the deconstructionists, because they were basically like, you're the reason I have to deconstruct in the first place. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to charge $275. That's an interesting racket. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think like four people might've at the time he took yeah. it down, had, had taken the free package, but. But even that shows that there's still something in him that says I need an atonement. Yeah. You know, right. Like I know that what I know I've sinned Uh huh. and yeah. I can't live with that. I got to do something to purify this. So here, here's a <laughs> two seventy five. You'll get it for free. Wow. wow. Uh, you talk about the way that deconstruction begins. Uh, and you say it almost always begins with... Qu you say... <laughs> you say... <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good joke to insert there. Like oh, it begins man. with a... Well, now, this is not a joke. Crash. This is a, little, uh, this is a little nature fact that you'll probably appreciate. Uh, I learned the other day that all ants are females. Did you know that? The little insects? Well, I know all honeybees are female. All, all ants are... Yeah. If they were males, they'd be called uncles. Oh, that's good. Yeah, see, you're full of puns, I'm, and I'm not ready for them. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> knocking it out of the park. All right. Uh, always begin with questions, because questions are bad. We shouldn't ask questions. Right. No. So, yes. <laughs> that, uh, yes, they, they, many deconstructions begin with questions. Yeah. But we, because of the nature of that, we, we have a whole chapter on questions, because the yeah. problem with that is that some questions are honest, and some aren't. 
Yeah, that's right. You, you say know? that some people are seeking answers. Other people are seeking exits. Yeah. Some, some people ask a question because they truly want to know the answer. Mm-hmm. Other people ask a question because they're seeking justification for the unbelief that they're already wanting to hold yeah. on to. And, and some we say are unaccepted or unacceptable because what often happens too is like, I'm, I'm not going to deny that there are church environments that shut questions down. In fact, that's the sure. thing we say, please do a Q&A. We'd, we'd love for pastors to start that. doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Which just, as a pastor, by the way, I'm not going to do. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's just no way, but go <laughs> Thank on. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, to foster or maybe even a Wednesday night thing or something once yeah. in a while to yeah. to at least send the message that we we want the questions, right? Mm, yeah. But the problem Tim is sometimes- Tim Keller in New York, he did that. He did, and we, yeah, we actually talk well. about Tim yeah. with that. Um, but the problem is, is that when the, when the correct answer is given, it's not acceptable. Mm-hmm. And so they'll, this happened with me, with uh, someone in my life who was deconstructing. She, she kept asking questions about textual criticism. So I'd send her resources. I would answer the question as best I could. And then she'd sort of rephrase the question and ask the same question again. And I, I would be confused about how to answer because I'm like, well, I just sent her like three books she could read on this. And, and, and I realized after a while, oh, she doesn't, mm-hmm. she doesn't want the answer. Yeah. She wants to believe that the Bible is this tool of oppression that was written by these guys that want to keep women subjugated. The and patriarchy. that's what she yeah. wants to believe. Yeah. And there's nothing I can do to help her until her heart opens to truth. Yeah. And so there's that dynamic as well. And I mean, we know this because of the sin that lives in our own heart. I mean, how many times have we seen the answer? God put it there right in mm-hmm. front of our face, blue, right? And we just go, no, nah, green. And we yeah. just keep denying and denying yeah. and the Lord has to come and open our eyes. We see this in discipleship relationships as a pastor. It's really tough to be in a lot of counseling situations where people will ask for an answer. And sometimes I just, I'm trying to give you wisdom. Oh, this is so complicated. I'm going to try to get you to some scriptures, but nothing's like a knockout. But sometimes I'm like, listen, it's literally yeah. right here. It's only like four words sometimes. And people yeah. will go, oh, I'm not seeing it. Yeah. So yeah, this, the, the, the question asker who's not genuinely seeking is a reality we have to deal with. It's a reality that Jesus had to deal with. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, answer a fool according to his folly. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Those two are back to back. How come? Because the Bible's filled with contradictions. Don't you (laughs) know this? That's what I was getting at. Yeah, (laughs) They're back to back because they're both good advice for different situations. Wisdom dictates, right? Sometimes you're going to be in a conversation with someone who's deconstructing and you have to realize, oh, I'm actually just casting pearls before swine. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you're, you'll wrestle with people for a long time and the Lord will bless it and they will actually yeah. remain in the faith. And I even think of a, like what Tim does with Red Pen Logic where he's answering a fool according to their folly, but for millions of viewers so that yes. they can find clarity as well. You know, Russell is one of the best apologists. Uh, he just sort of naturally, he's just so gifted at it. And, uh, and I would see him get into debates on our Defend and Confirm stuff sometimes with people. And I'd be like, bro, you're killing me. Like, you got to chill out. <laughs> And then, and I, I, I didn't prepare, I don't have it pulled up right now, but there's a section in the book of Acts that he sent me where it basically talks about Paul debating the Jews uh, in front of others who were edified by the way that Paul handled the scriptures, right? So that is another category. It's yeah. not just me and my interlocutor, if I'm using that word correctly. I, I believe that was correct. That was Nailed good. It. Yes. Uh, I thought that's what I used to see really far away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my interlocutors. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, but so that's, it's not just, you know, me and you. It's also there are people watching when we're having yeah. these conversations publicly and they can be really edified, equipped, strengthened, encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you say that deconstruction is like a kind of death. It's a mm-hmm. death for the person who goes through it, but it's also a kind of death for people who love the person who's going through it. Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, in the deconstruction hashtag and in lots of deconstruction stories, um, I think one misconception that some Christians have about deconstructionists is that it's just easy. It's just, oh, I don't like this. I'm going to walk away. And Mm. and a lot of them describe a lot of emotional anguish. I mean, this was their core identity. And I mean, that doesn't mean there's not rebellion in there and all sorts of stuff, but um, it's very agonizing process for a lot of people. So it can feel like a death for them also because their entire community that has always been their community is going to be different now. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's a lot, Um, but it can feel like a death for their family too. And, uh, that, that is the thing to me that is the hardest about this whole thing is I meet these sweet elderly parents Mm -hmm. all the time. This is Mm -hmm. very common where they'll come up to me, tears in their eyes, 
we don't know what to do. We raised our daughter in the church mm -hmm. and she's deconstructed. She won't let us see our grandkids now. She tells us we're mm -hmm. toxic. Yeah. I think we start the book with a, a one of those stories, yeah. but that's a very common story that, yeah. that I come across. And, and you can so, do everything right and that can still happen. That's right. I think someone might hear that and think, well, yeah, if you raise your kid and you don't disciple them well and they're not in a healthy church, well, yeah, that doesn't help. But you can actually knock it out of the park. And, That's right. Yeah, it can and people happen. grow up all kinds of ways. People grow up with atheist parents and become strong Christians. So you know, you yeah. know exactly. So uh, I always try to minister that to them. But it it can feel like a death because in many cases, the impetus to disconnect from your church community and even your blood family mm. is so strong because they truly believe you you are an unsafe, harmful person. Yeah. Not just that you have these fuddy-duddy, you know, old-fashioned beliefs, yeah. but that you are actually harming people. When I go home on Thanksgiving, I have to confront my family members about their oppression. Yeah. Right? And and if they won't listen, then I have to cut them off. I've I've had people tell me yeah, that. Yeah, and like, there are, oh my goodness, so many threads in the deconstruction hashtag about what to do at Thanksgiving. Yeah. How do you handle Thanksgiving? Yeah. And and uh yeah, so it can feel that way, especially in many cases they receive a no contact letter. Yeah. I've met people, yep, we got a no contact letter. We're not allowed to reach out, we're not allowed to text, we're not mm. allowed to, you know, ask how they're doing. And this is really painful for a lot of Christian parents and I mean, oh, and the relationship dynamics, it can yeah. be a spouse, it can be a best friend, it can be, uh, you know, a, I had a, a high school girl stand up in a Q&A and ask me how to navigate her parents' deconstruction. Mm -hmm. wow. Like, how do I Gosh. honor them, but yeah. keep faithful to Jesus? Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can't help but compare uh, someone who's deconstructing going home for the holidays and s some friends that I have number of them with children who have abandoned the faith and the different ways that they handle that when they come together and try to be a family. Uh, one of my friends in particular is so desperate to show mercy and grace to this wayward child at the same time, maintain healthy boundaries mm -hmm. for the sake of the family. Um, and for, honestly, for the testimony of the gospel, Whereas very often the deconstructing, there's no grace, there's no mercy. Yeah. It's kind of like, listen, I figured this out and I'm bringing the law. And if you don't submit and if you don't repent immediately, we're done. Yeah. You're getting cut off. Yeah. Uh, which is, again, it just goes back to this, like, actually, I don't think, I think you're the harsh one yeah. in this scenario. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is when we were preparing for this book, Tim and I reached out to several deconstructionists to try to have a private Zoom call. Yeah. And some did. And yeah. we were very thankful that we got to just, you know, ask them questions and yeah. try to characterize this correctly. But we had one who responded basically like, I will not speak to you because of your beliefs. I won't mm -hmm. even have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you are you are toxic and be, and I think the word was because of your worldview. I yeah. won't even have a discussion with you. Have you seen that chart where it walks through critical theory and it's it basically compares like every aspect of that religion with the Christian religion and how they're basically the same, you know, uh what what is the world? How should we live? What is sin? How do we make atonement? And as you go down through one, every they both have the same categories, but one is filled with hope. Mm. Grace is real. Redemption is possible. The other one is just yeah. the burden, the burden mm. of the law. The you work. just never come out from yeah. under that. You know, it's it's yeah. crippling. Yeah. Uh, and I feel bad for some people, for a lot of people who have deconstructed, but they've not really deconstructed from Christianity. They've mm. deconstructed from one kind of workspace religion to mm. another kind of workspace mm -hmm. religion. And so in some sense, it wasn't even that hard of a transition for them because they yeah. never even really tasted grace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, I can, I'm rambling now. This is your interview, no, not this mine. It's good, it's good. You say that virtually every deconstruction story speaks of a trigger event or several trigger events. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so we were trying to figure out why the question we started with was why can there be two people that grow up in the same house, go to the same church, have the same pastors, have the same summer camp experiences, same mission trip experiences, and then some kind of a crisis can happen and one walks away and one walks closer to the Lord. Mm. How, what's the what's the answer to why that is? Yeah. And so what we came up with. And you mean from a secondary cost perspective? Right. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So it's like I'm thinking of Jacob and Esau. Right. Same right. Womb, you yeah. Know? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. Um, so so what is what are what's going on? You know. And so what we think about is 
someone's foundation, and this is maybe where this will circle into to your comment just here. Um, I think there are a lot of people who grew up in the church, grew up in Christian families, believed even some of the right things. Demons believe the right things, right? Yeah, right. Um, I think my sister was an example of somebody like this. I, okay. My sister did not become a Christian until she was an adult. Oh. Um, she How went, old? She was probably, I want to say maybe late 20s, early 30s. Okay. Um, went through a horrible, um, you know, this is when we were living in LA, goth, industrial, yeah. you know, drugs, alcoholic, yeah. hardcore. Like LA. Yeah, and and she, she will say like, I wasn't a Christian before. Yeah. But she might have believed the right things, gone along with Christian culture, might have even thought she was a Christian. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of that. And so that's what we call the foundation, okay. is what is the person's faith foundation? Um, did they actually believe that all these things were true or did they believe in Jesus? Mm -hmm. Did they trust in Jesus mm -hmm. for their salvation? So I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, so that's the foundation. And then the crisis can be lots of different things. It could be the death of a loved one. It could be church hurt. It could be the moral failing of their pastor, the mishandling of the moral failure of their pastor, perceived hypocrisy in the Christians in their lives. Yeah. And for the person who is saved, they're, they're going to, God is going to use that in their life to build them stronger, even if for a season there's doubt, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But then you have somebody who didn't have that foundation. And so that crisis is going to, and then it can be compound crisis. You yeah. know, it could be a lot of different things altogether. Um, and that's the best I could come up with it because I, I know people that have been through the same exact church hurt. Yeah. And one walks away and one gets stronger. Yeah. And so I think it's it's the intersection of the foundation and then the crisis. The triggering event. The triggering yeah. events, yeah. Wow, that's really good. And you can have a triggering event with the person who is, you know, who has trusted in Jesus and it can send them wobbling, I mean, for sure. And yeah. they could go through like what I went through where I I just didn't even know what I believed. Yeah. Um, but I, there, there does seem to be a crisis that yeah. triggers it. I went through something kind of similar to that uh, when, when I first... When uh, when I got saved, I, I was a drug dealing gangbanger, and uh, I got pretty powerfully saved. A radical transformation overnight. But then I tried to go to church, and in the Christian South, I mean, I had gold teeth with vampire fangs. It was <laughs> kind of wild, and it did not go well. And the first person who discipled me taught me the prosperity gospel. Mm. And I got deep in the prosperity gospel. And I, I so closely associated the gospel and walking with Jesus with what was essentially a cult. Mm. Uh, that when I left the prosperity gospel, thank you, John Piper, for the video that you put on the internet. Very helpful. Uh, and thank you, Lord, for your word, more importantly, <laughs> in your Holy Spirit, in your church. Uh, uh, that was the event that that sent my head spinning, right? Leaving the prosperity gospel. And it got so bad that for a little while I was entertaining Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. They were coming, they come, they came by my house and I was like, sure, why not? Come yeah. in, tell me why the Trinity isn't biblical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interestingly, your husband, uh, well, by the way, what's your husband's name? Mike. Mike, he told me that earlier, but I forgot. Sorry, Mike. Uh, Mike kind of being like, hey, <laughs> we're done. Yeah. My wife kind of did that. Huh. We were, I think we met with him for like six or seven weeks. And finally, one day, she basically like hit me upside the head. She was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And while they were there, we just shut it down. Um, so praise God for that. But it could have gone another direction, right? So, yeah. so which, which, is, which gets back to what I, I brought up earlier, primary and secondary causes. Secondary causes what we can see, right, from, yeah. from the human perspective. But underneath that, it's nothing but the sovereign grace of God. Yeah. Uh, why Jacob and not Esau? Why Judas, you know, why, why, why Peter and not Judas? Well, it's all a grace, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually already talked about uh, the difference between Reformation and Deconstruction. But let's come back to that because there's a great illustration in the book that I want to talk about. Uh, you talk about the two different paintings. Oh, the yes. Salva, uh, I, I Salvatore Mundi yeah. and the, uh, I think it's Eke Homo. Homo. I want to say it with a Spanish accent. Yes, yeah. Yes. So tell us about that. Okay, so I don't know if you remember 
several years ago, this went viral and I could not stop laughing yeah. so hard because what happened was in Spain, I believe it was in Spain, there was a fresco of Jesus, an old fresco of Jesus that had been uh, dilapidated over yeah. the years yeah. and just, you couldn't really, so, so a, a local woman took, who's not a professional artist, took it upon herself to restore the painting. Now you can look this up and I encourage everybody oh, I did. to it's look up hilarious. Eke Homo. Yeah. And what she, what she did was, I, I think I wrote in the book, um, it looked like Picasso got drunk and drew a proboscis monkey with his yes. left hand, you know? Yes. Um, and which Picasso was right-handed, by the way. I looked that up to be sure. That but that with Picasso, you know, he's all two eyes on the same side of the yeah, face. Yeah. Come on, buddy, look around. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. So it, it's just, it's hilarious. And it went viral because it was so, it was just so funny. And yeah. now it's kind of this tourist spot where people will go see it and there's merch and you can yeah. buy a mug yeah, or something, yeah. you know. It may be the best thing that ever happened to that painting. That I yeah, agree. It's blown for up. For different yeah, reasons, right? For different right? reasons, yeah. Um, but with uh, the other one, the Salvador Mundi, this was what is being referred to as the lost Leonardo. So yeah. this was a painting The that, male Mona Lisa. Yeah, the male Mona Lisa, beautiful painting. A uh, lot of art scholars thought it might've been uh, attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh -huh. And so um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but the, the art restorer, she was this professional and it took her, I mean, if you watch, you can watch the documentary on okay. this. It, the painstaking process of her just slowly, barely touching it to uh -huh. remove the, the, because uh -huh. there were some um, warping and there was some varnish that was added. So just the careful, I mean, uh, I, I think it was years of yeah. just removing yeah. the little things and then just barely touching it with her hand, trying to restore what was actually there. Yeah. And so, uh, and it ended up selling for like, it was the highest selling painting in history. Yeah, like I couldn't millions. believe how much it sold yeah. for. I don't remember what the number was, it was but when millions. I read it, I was like, it was whoa, millions. hundreds of millions, I Yes, think. hundreds yeah. of millions. And uh, now it's disappeared. People don't know like yeah, who bought it or where it is. Trip. It's all mysterious. Maybe but, on a boat. Yeah, on a, a yacht, boat, a right? yacht, a like yacht some chic or, yeah. or something. <laughs> but she um, she really believed it was a Leonardo da Vinci and so did many others. Now yeah. that's been contested and they go back and forth about it. But um, but for the sake of your illustration. Yeah. her The point of it, though, was the other lady just slapped some paint on and just, well, he probably looked like this, you yeah. know. And with with this one, it was like this painstaking process of trying hard to not be seen as the restorer. I want just what originally was painted to be the only thing that comes through. Mm. And that was the goal. And so deconstruction seems to be more like the, the uh, Eke Homo, yeah. you know. Let me fix your Christianity. Let me fix this <laughs> yeah. and, you know, X this out. And, yeah. and then it just is not a beautiful thing anymore. Yeah. Whereas Reformation is more like what, um, Modestini was her name, the Nailed art restorer. Yeah, I can't remember her first name, but it was Modestini. You know, what she did was what we should do as Reformation. If there have been things that have covered up the gospel yeah. or, or marred the, you know, your, your understanding of the scriptures, let's, let's remove those things yeah. and let's restore the beauty yeah. of the gospel and the word of God. Yeah. And, and so I thought that was such a, a great picture. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I thought it was great. Okay. So let's talk about toxic theology. Ah, the word toxic, it has made its way into our vocabulary. I hear people using it all the time. Uh, when it comes to toxic theology, you say it's a catch-all term that's being used to describe any doctrine that one deems har harmful. And harmful is in terms of uh, power, right? Mm -hmm. Who's using this as a means of power to suppress justice and thriving mm -hmm. and well-being? Yeah, this comes from postmodernism. Mm -hmm. So this is this is how I try to help people understand this. Most postmodern people... It's not that they necessarily would deny that there is an objective truth, but they just wouldn't say it can be known, especially when it comes to religion and morality. Mm -hmm. So most people don't walk around like relativists. They go to the bank, they expect their money to be there. They, you know, obey traffic lights. They're, yeah. they're, there's objective truth that can be known. But when it comes to religion and morality, the postmodern person has put those more in the category of like, what's your favorite sports team? What yeah. kind of ice cream do you like? What's your favorite dessert or your favorite meal? This is the Nancy Piercy upper story, lower right. story. Yeah. yeah, so Nancy Piercy building on the work of Francis Schaeffer kind of yeah. did it like a house. In so, total truth, right? Yeah, total yeah. truth, that's right. So there's upper story and a lower story. Lower story is facts and logic. This is public truth everybody has access to. Mm -hmm. But then in the upper story, you have like your favorite flavor of ice cream, preferences, opinions. Yeah. Well, our culture has put religion and morality in the upstairs, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not, and it should be with facts and science and logic and all that, but it's and not, it's with opinion and preference. So here's how I try to 
help people understand it is if you're postmodern and you truly don't believe that absolute truth about religion or morality can be known, then when the Christian comes along claiming to know what it is and telling you what you need to believe to be saved, then you're not even interacting on the level of, well, is that true what they're saying? Because mm -hmm. you don't even think that can be known, that yeah. truth could be known. Yeah. So you're immediately going to go to motive. Well, why would they be saying that? Well, the church must have invented the doctrine of hell to control people with fear. Mm -hmm. The church uses uh, this idea that you're a sinner and you need substitutionary atonement to keep people in the fold, to prop up their institution, to make sure you don't leave, to make sure they keep control over you. Yeah. And, and I think there, it's an outflow also of this whole idea flowing out of Marxism that, you know, he, it's not humans that corrupt the institutions, it's the institutions that corrupt humans. And yeah. it's basically boils down to whether or not you think people are sinners or not. Yeah. And so it's sort of built on that people are naturally good, they're morally good, and if you just left them alone, they would do good things. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's really what that's all coming from. So any kind of objective truth claim that Christians would make that they say you have to believe this too is toxic because toxic, yeah. that's authoritarian. You're just trying to keep control over me. You don't want me to be my truest self or whatever wording they might use. Yeah. Uh, so much of this comes back to postmodernism and, and really critical theory, which uh, have reified postmodernism. Have you read Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay's? Cynical theories. Cynical theories. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And they even have a simplified version because you can't give that book to everybody. It's yeah. a little, little too academic. That paired with uh, the Truman book, yeah. Really goes a long way. Yes. Yeah. And he has a simpler version of that one he too. Does. Which yeah. I was, Strange New World. I was thankful yeah. for. Yeah. Give away the the thin version of the Pluck Rose Lindsay book along with Brave New World to anyone who's really trying to think through these things carefully. Yeah. That's not uh, about your book, but that's, no, you would I, agree. I, that's a good I agree. recommendation. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you, you guys do a really good job of simplifying things throughout the book. And I thought this section was helpful. You say that. The deconstruction project works in three simple steps. Step number one, identify a problem in society. And that word problem maybe could even be put in quotation marks, mm -hmm, right? Whatever mm -hmm, you deem to be right. a problem. Yep. Uh, we'll just put capitalism in mm -hmm. there. Right? That's right, okay. yeah. Uh, two, show how the church actively endorsed or passively allowed injustice, uh, which would be the problem. And then three, conclude that hundreds of years of participation in white supremacy, patriarchy, and nationalism have warped white evangelical theology such that it needs to be fundamentally reimagined. Yeah. That's very succinct, isn't it? Very succinct, and, yeah. And that Streamlined. actually um, is yeah. coming from Neil Shenvey's work. I so, love Neil's yeah, work Neil's so the good. one who, and we're quoting him there because he um, wrote an article and he put it so simply like that. And I was like, that is really mm -hmm. good. And yeah. that's really when I started to, when I read that from Neil, or it might've even been something he said on my podcast. I can't remember where we quoted it from. It's in the book. It'll be footnoted in there. But, yeah. um, but it was, it was so clear. Like yeah. that is exactly what happens. Like the perceived problem might be capitalism, yeah. right? In quotes. Right. Mm -hmm. And well, if the church maybe used capitalism to promote injustice, uh -huh. well, then now it's connected to all of this oppression that is, yeah. and everything is white, is like white supremacy. Yeah. That's the problem underneath all of it. And so you can almost get to that from anywhere, yeah. like any perceived problem. That's right, yeah. It's a pretty interesting setup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you read much Thomas Sowell? You know, I have not. I've okay. heard in like a couple of yeah. talks that he's done, but I need okay. to. I know I need to. I just haven't yet. Uh, I would start with, uh, there's a book called A Conflict of Visions. Mm. It's probably his most important work. Uh, he basically goes, why is it that people who trend what we would call liberal and other people who trend what we would call conservative tend to always line up on the same side of debate? So like, you know that if someone's liberal, they're going to have a problem with capitalism. They're going to have a problem with heterosexuality. They're going to be pro LGBT. Uh, and you, you can just, you can just, t I can just tell you exactly what they're going to believe. And yeah. it, very rarely do you find someone who like believes this, but not that. Mm -hmm. And he, he basically does, I think is just really good common grace reasoning. The Bible gets you there. He doesn't go, get to the Bible. I don't think he's a Christian, but he basically says it's due to our anthropology. Mm. If, if you think that human beings are fundamentally good and that human nature is fundamentally good and that we can, we, we can always trend towards the good, which how do you define that? That's another question. Mm -hmm. 
then you're going to tend to have this view of the world and that's going to lead to these conclusions. But if you distrust human nature because you think it's flawed or sinful, then you're going to trend towards these views. And then, you know, he enumerates them. I kind of butchered that, but well worth well yeah. worth the time to read because yeah. it's it is interesting that whenever you read through like point number three white supremacy patriarchy nationalism capitalism sexuality like they always line up together yeah 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 moving on uh in chapter nine you say that deconstruction is more like a vivisection i think my wife had one of those with our second daughter yeah. um no, that's a C section. C section. Yeah, okay. It's like a viv- that would not be good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you said that deconstruction is more like a vivisection than a dissection. Yes. What do you mean by that? So this was kind of a fun part to write about because in my original another gospel book, I had ta- compared deconstruction to dissection. It's yeah. like um, you know, dissecting the parts of, of something. Like in uh, an, uh, anatomy and biology, like Yeah, um, you do a, a pig, fetal pig right? yeah. or something, yeah. yeah. And so Tim was a high school science teacher, and he said, you know, I, I think we need to talk about vivisection because with dissection, you're cutting apart a dead thing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you puncture a lung or you nick an artery because the thing is dead. Yeah. And when, you know, if the Christian faith were like that, then yeah, hack it apart, who cares? Yeah but it's actually a living thing. Yeah. So vivisection is more like experimental surgery where you're very careful. Yeah. You know, you, you, you gotta be careful not to nick an artery, not to puncture a lung or slash a muscle or something like that because yeah. the thing that you're operating on has value. Yeah, you're trying to preserve it. You're trying to yeah. preserve it and fix what's wrong. And so in deconstruction, so often it's like the value is not really assigned to the thing. So yeah, they're just hacking it apart yeah. and there's no um, value given to, to what they're tearing apart in the first place. Yeah. So speaking of uh, caring about this this thing that we're taking a scalpel to, uh, you guys talk, uh, I'd never heard this before. I thought, I mean, and I felt like I have, but I haven't heard it the way that you guys said it. You you, you talk a lot about how faith is relational, not informational. Mm. Uh, what's the difference there? Well, I think it's, it's a lot of Christians maybe don't understand grace. You know, grace mm-hmm. is unmerited favor. Mm-hmm. It's like every false gospel is a workspace gospel. We want to earn it. We want God to look down and be like, I see you, you know, you're, you're doing such good yeah, work over the there. Best, I'm going to pick bud. you for my yeah. team. You know, you'd be a good asset I'm really for lucky me. to have you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know if it's all the nineties rom-coms or the Disney movies yeah. where we're just like, we want to be noticed. But, um, I think, you know, it's a misunderstanding of, of grace. And I, I lost the question. I just forgot. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Remind faith me. being relational versus right, relational. Right. Yeah, so, that's right. so, um, when I think a lot of Christians kind of alluded to this before, yeah. they believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They believe yeah. that Jesus even is the Messiah. Yeah. They believe that Christianity is true. They believe that the Bible is the word of God, but they've never trusted in Christ yeah. for themselves. It's, it's and that's intellectual the difference. ascent, not faith. Right. Yeah. It's intellectual ascent. They checked the right boxes. Mm-hmm. And I think we see that a lot in the deconstruction movement. Where, yeah. And this is the interesting thing. If you listen to deconstruction story after deconstruction story, I still have never heard one where, and, and Sean McDowell, whenever he talks on his podcast with people who have deconstructed, he always yeah. asks them this question. Okay. Like, what was your conversion? Tell me about your conversion. And okay. he'll tell his story of being convicted of his sin, crying out to Jesus to yeah. save him from yeah. his sin, repenting, like, save me, uh, you know, in sackcloth yeah. and ashes. Yeah. And they never have that. Right. It's it's like, well, I knew Jesus. Jesus was my buddy or mm-hmm. um, he was real to me. I, I, I went to church my whole life. I my went dad to was church. A I believed yeah. all the things. But you have to listen very carefully. Mm-hmm. But it's the relational aspect. Yeah. And and the one that came the closest, I think, was Rhett McLaughlin. I don't know if you heard his like three hour deconstruction mm-hmm. story. He was Who the, is that? well, he and uh, Rhett and Link of the Good Mythical Morning, they had a very viral deconstruction story. They were okay. crew member. I mean, they missionaries with crew. Luke's heard of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it was really um, that his deconstruction story rattled a lot of people. Okay. And one of the reasons was because he did such a good job of describing his relationship with Jesus. But it was so interesting because he's talking about how much he really knew Jesus. He knew Jesus. Jesus, you know, I prayed all the time. I did this. But then he gets to the end of his deconstruction story, and he's basically saying he doesn't even think Jesus was resurrected. So who does he think he was talking to? Yeah. And so if you really listen carefully, then you'll get the language that there wasn't that 
relationship. Yeah. You know, now deconstructionists lose their minds when we say things like this sure. because they say, absolutely, I was a Christian. Yeah. Um, well, how can you have a relationship with a person who's not real? That's right. They have to, in some sense, And, and I think, it. honestly, no matter where you land on the, you know, the Calvinist or non-Calvinist yeah. side of the aisle, I think it'd be very hard to make a case that people who fully walk away and stay walked away were ever truly yeah, saved. They went out from among us to prove because they, they were, were not never, yeah. with us. Yeah. Um, man, there's, there's so many threads I could, I could pull out there because, uh, wow, that's, that's really rich. Let me just go to actually something you say in the book that I think is a, a pretty good illustration of this point you're making. You use this illustration. You say reevaluating the belief that your spouse is faithful is different from say, taking a second look at the belief that your car gets 25 miles per gallon. Both examine a belief, but the former is tied to a relationship. That's right. That was so good. Yeah. 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 So if you think of um, like a marriage relationship, and this is where I think it makes the point about the relational aspect that's yeah. missing from so many deconstruction stories yeah. is, you know, um, and Tim wrote a section about even his wife, like loving my wife. It's like, if I say my wife's name is Stacy, she has blonde hair right. and she's a mom of three. It's like, she's going to be like, dude, like, yeah. do you even know me? Did you just, did you just find me on like, Facebook and read my that's bio? That's the most, yeah. you know, like benign, you know, yeah. description. But then he says, but now if I describe her and he goes into detail mm -hmm. about who mm -hmm. she is and, and what her, her thoughts and feelings and loves and the talents and all the things about her, well, now you know, okay, he actually has met his yeah. wife, right? Yeah. And so um, very often in the deconstruction <coughs> stories, it's like they're approaching it not like it's a, a, a relationship. Yeah. And, and in the cases of the ones that are, there's that great grief and pain. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I remember what I was going to say earlier, uh, hearing you talk about people's testimonies and what's noticeably absent makes me think about just certain membership interviews I've had. So mm -hmm. if you want to join our church, we have, you go through membership classes and then we have a membership interview, which is, you know, we don't put you under a heat lamp, and, <laughs> you know, grill you like the Spanish Inquisition. We just want to make sure to the best of our abilities that you are, are actually a Christian. We ask to hear your understanding of the gospel. And we also ask to hear your testimony. We write it down. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there have been times where many times where people have come in and their testimony, I say, Hey, give me your testimony. And by the way, if you just go, if you, if you come to church with us on a Sunday and we go out to lunch and nobody at our church knows you, you're going to share your testimony. <laughs> and so often we hear stories like, yeah, you know, uh, grew up in the church and uh, my dad was a deacon and, uh, you know, I was really active in the youth group and then I was active in a group in college and then I found you guys online, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Now, sometimes uh, people tell their testimony like that because they've been poorly discipled, mm. right? Sure. If, you know, sometimes even with your children, they're telling you a story and you got to, you know what they're trying to say, but you right. kind of- Or they're not help. good with words. So, yeah, yeah, they're not good with words. Yeah. And so you got to kind of help them. And we've had that where it's like, yeah, but- what about conviction of sin, the lordship of Christ? You know, oh yeah, well I had this experience, and then you kind of get there. But uh, sometimes people don't have those categories at all because they're they're not Christians. They haven't understood the gospel, and and uh, and I'm sure that that's a lot of what you hear in these deconstruction stories. Yeah, yeah. it is, and I think too with the rise of the seeker sensitive mega church model mm -hmm. over the last fifty years or so, yeah. I think it's just it's prime environment for that kind of a thing to happen where yeah. people really think they're Christians because they go to church and yeah. they're part of things and they're involved. It's and, experiential. Yeah. And there are different iterations of this throughout history. So you take, for example, the second great awakening, trying to re-engineer revival. A lot of people after that profess to be Christians just because they had an experience, you know, they yeah. were at the anxious bench and people were. You know, yeah. And uh, that's how Mormonism got <laughs> gained right. so much steam from that. Uh, uh, Ian Murray in his fantastic book, Revival and Revivalism calls that whole section of New England that was affected by the Second Great Awakening, the burned over district, mm. uh, because the gospel went, th the, 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 the movement went through and basically like inoculated people to the gospel. Oh, wow. And then out of that came Joseph Smith and yeah. a lot of bad yeah. fruit. A lot yeah. of bad fruit yeah. came yeah. from that. Yeah. Uh, you had to probably sift through a lot of, of really nasty anti-gospel propaganda mm. while researching this book. When, when I wrote with Mike McKinley, our book on the prosperity gospel, I told Mike, I said, man, if you want to use 
like if you want direct quotes and stuff, I'm not going to go back and read a bunch of T.D. Jake's books and mm-hmm. Joel, watch Joel Osteen's sermons. I just, I don't think I have it in me. I, yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, I, I imagine that must have been really hard for you. It was very hard. Yeah. It was, it was very dark. I even felt it a little bit while I was reading the book. I mm-hmm. felt like this feels like spiritual warfare. Yeah. I remember when I would have to spend a day in the hashtag I'd, I'd be asking people yeah. to pray for me. Like yeah, I got to right. go into this hashtag today. And it was like, it is, the, this is the thing I always try to give people hope with too, is that it is such a dark, you want to talk about toxic. Oh, yeah. It is such oh, a yeah. dark and toxic, just hopeless mm-hmm. place um, that it gives me hope that, I don't know, I, this is the, a theory I have that perhaps God in his sovereignty is using this to bring people back to him that never were with him. Yeah, they get to the bottom yeah. of that darkness yeah. and see what life is really like without mm-hmm. the nice Christian stuff they got to experience growing yeah. up. And maybe we'll see some kind of revival. I don't know, but it is so dark and toxic. It, yeah, it was. It was not. It was not fun. It was definitely a sacrifice. It was a labor of love. I did not enjoy it. Yeah, uh, your theory. Uh, I think it's biblical. It reminds me of First Corinthians five. Uh, you know, handing them over to Satan. Some of those people who are handed over were probably never actually Christians. Mm -hmm. There's a Hebrew six connection here and and here somewhere, the rains that fall and such. But uh, depending on how you interpret Hebrew six, they're they're being handed over to Satan. So again, thinking about this pastorally, I'm thinking about people that we have had to discipline out of membership in our church. And one of the things that we often say in our members meetings is pray that as they are sent back out into the world and they experience the harsh, ugly, painful world that is out there, that they will then come to their senses because it is the realm of Satan. It is his kingdom. It is harsh. It is nasty. There is no grace. There's a reason why, uh, you know, it's, it, nature is red in tooth and claw. It's, it's, it's fierce out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I pray that right there along with yeah. you, sister. Um, had a question, lost it. It wasn't planned. Oh, I'm back better than ever. <laughs> uh, I notice. uh, listen, I get it. You can't say everything that needs to be said in a book. And maybe you had this, maybe this was one of the 20,000 words <laughs> that you guys cut out. Uh, but I noticed that spiritual warfare doesn't, factor in here at all. Have you thought about spiritual warfare and connection and deconstruction at all? Yeah, we actually did have a little paragraph or two about okay. it. In that there. made it in? That did make Shoot, it in, yes. I feel bad. You, you must okay. have missed it. It's okay. I read every word. I believe okay. you. But you know, you, always, you can't yeah, always remember. Right. And it was just a small little thing. Um, yeah, we, we did mention that. And really how, you know, of course, me coming from more the charismatic <clears> side of things, I always thought spiritual warfare was like binding demons and, you know, <laughs> the the what we called power encounters in the, in the book. And, um, Is that where the guys tear the phone books in half? Oh, the power team. <laughs> the power oh, team. I love the power <laughs> team. I loved those guys. Um, but you know, and, and certainly I, I want to be careful and say this too. We're not denying that demons exist in the, you know, supernatural. Yeah. Cause sometimes when we say this, people are like, Oh, but demons are real. It's like, yeah, no, we're not saying demons are not real. But when the Bible talks about spiritual warfare, the primary mm-hmm. way it talks about it is it's more ideas. like truth encounters. Yeah, that's right. Not, not necessarily power yeah. encounters. It's truth encounters. It's speaking truth into the lies. And so, um, yeah, there, there is, uh, there was a lot of spiritual warfare where I would have to sit there and say, I'm going to just be faithful, consistent, speak the truth, know what I, you know, know what's true about God and yeah. about who wins and, and just continue yeah. and just be, you know, uh, I, I think some of the, Best spiritual warfare is just faithfulness, just Amen. being consistent. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, going back to people who want to not not give nuance, you know, you're saying demons aren't real. When, when you look at spiritual warfare in the Bible, it is inextricably connected to truth claims. Yeah, right. it is. Uh, Satan is the father of, of lies. lies yes. the, Jesus calls the Pharisees sons of their father because they are twisting scripture. So... Yeah, that, that's it's not a juxtaposition. It's not an either or. Right. It is a both and. Whenever someone's preaching a false gospel, you are having a power encounter. That's right. Yes. Nobody may be falling out. Doctrines Nobody's going to be bound. Demons, yeah. But it, there are demonic forces at work. Uh, and, uh, you know, people who minister in more uh, animistic societies have different experiences with demonic forces. But in our highly intellectual world, yeah, yeah that's often how it manifests. Yeah, I agree. Um. You have a section in here, which I thought was very good. Again, Pastor Worley, I'm just interpreting. I'm reading this book through through the lens of, of how I'm going to be using this book, which, by mm-hmm. the way, I am going to be using it. Okay. I've already recommended it to several people. Um, 
you have this really good pastoral section about how we should treat those who are deconstructing. And you say that we need to treat them uh, with love and respect. And then you go to talking about uh, how the Bible addresses doubters. And I thought this was really sweet. You just, you just quote Jude uh, 22, have mercy on those who doubt. Yeah. And then you talk about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, where you talk about how those who are in deconstruction are actually captives. 2 uh, Timothy 2, 25 and 26, correcting his opponents with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, devil Excuse me, after being captured by him to do his will. Hmm. Yeah. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons we wanted to put that in there is because Tim and I have both experienced doubt personally. Um, yeah. You know, we, we tell a little bit of our stories in the book as well. And I'm so thankful for Jesus' response to doubters. Oh, uh, think yes. about John the Baptist. I mean, I know there's some debate over whether or not that was actually doubt, but I mean, he was, yeah. I think he was doubting. He are was, you really are the you, Messiah? I yeah. mean, and John, I mean, if you think of, if there's one person in all of history who should not doubt, it would be John because yeah. he encountered the entire Trinity with his senses. He yeah. saw the son of the spirit of God descend mm -hmm. like a dove, heard the audible voice of God yeah. and touched the son. I mean, with yeah. his hands, you know. Good and, job. I'm not messing that up, by the way. Thank you. I, I've worked on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, he encountered the Trinity like yeah. nobody else really has. And yet he's in Herod's prison cell and he, and he doubts. And Jesus is so tender. Jesus yeah. doesn't shame him. No. He doesn't say, yeah. oh, you know, John, just read your Bible or you should just believe and don't yeah. ask those questions around here. You know, Jesus. Dude, you baptize me. Come yeah, on, man. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But he he <clears throat> referenced his miracles. He gave him evidence yeah. and, and he was so merciful to him. And so I think that um, that's one thing that a lot of Christians, I think maybe we could improve on is yeah. giving people a little bit of space yeah. for doubt. Because when I was in my really heavy times of doubt, there were a couple of different people in my life. I didn't talk about it a lot. I didn't tell a lot of people because I yeah. didn't want anyone else to lose their faith. I right? think that's wise. And uh, yet I had one person who was very fearful. Every time I would just, well, what about... Oh, it was just, it was fear. Yeah. And I didn't want to talk to that person. Yeah. But I had another person in my life that mm. was just really relaxed about it and yeah. didn't like force me to come to a conclusion like right then and there. Yeah. And so I think Christians, maybe, you know, we can learn. But the frustrating thing though is we have to diagnose if the doubt is honest or not. And that's mm. the tough thing. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like my doubt was really honest. Yeah. I just, I really wanted, I wanted Christianity to be true. Yeah. I just, I needed some, some evidence. I needed to know what the evidence was. But there, like we talked about earlier, there are some people who it's not an honest question. It's yeah. not honest doubt. And they just want to yeah. justify their unbelief. A senior goes off to college, starts sleeping with his girlfriend, comes home. Exactly. Uh, tells his youth pastor, I, I don't just don't Think know I'm if an the atheist. Bible. Yeah. yeah, I just don't know if it's true. <laughs> yeah. And uh, lest anybody watching, uh, any of our viewers think that that's sort of uncharitable and a caricature, it is a very common experience. It's very common. Yeah. And in almost every deconstruction story, sex or sexuality mm -hmm. is in there somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Um, see, this is one of the issues with going along with interviews is I had another question, but my mind is fading and I, mm. I lost it somehow. Uh, I think it's important to remember, well, even when you're talking about heresy, there's a big difference between someone in your church who you find out believes something incorrect and someone who's teaching that which is incorrect. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with deconstruction, right? There's a big difference between someone in, in your church who may be wrestling with this and who may be going down the wrong path and someone who like is a deconstruction coach yeah. or, or who's trying to lead people down this path of deconstruction, yeah. right? We have to handle those two things differently. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it, I, I heard one of the best ways of uh, putting that about heresy was Philip Carey in his little book about the Nicene Creed. Okay. And I mean, this is a paraphrase, but it was basically like heresy isn't accidentally saying something wrong. Right. Heresy is being corrected and persisting in false doctrine. Yeah, you know? that's right. If you say that the father descended on Jesus accidentally in yeah, an right. interview, that's <laughs> yeah. not heresy. It's like, oops, I'm not a Christian. No. <laughs> I, yeah. I one time baptized somebody just in the name of Jesus. I left completely the father <laughs> and the son just yeah. out of it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We all say, you know, yeah. incorrect, imprecise things. No, but um, it's a sustained. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, this is where I think we bring in the conversation where Jesus calls 
people wolves. Yeah. And um, I've received a lot of hate and criticism for quoting Jesus on this, but I my thing is just, you know, take it up with Jesus because he's the one who decides He took a lot of heat and criticism. How that too, goes, so right? Yeah. Um and and he says there will be people you you creep in. It's like yeah. these these are people who are not coming from the outside. These are people in the church. Yeah. And you will recognize them by their fruits. And of course, the fruit of obedience, not the fruit of good feelings, like yeah. the progressives want to make it. Um, but do you, you know, is there fruit of obedience? But people who are actively evangelizing people and trying to take them away. I mean, it is so unreal. Some of the things I've seen in that hashtag. I remember a comment thread where a person came on and they said, you guys, I think I finally don't believe in hell anymore. Mm. And the, the overwhelming encouragement from everybody praise, you know, I mean, I, I, they didn't say praise God, yeah. but the equivalent of that, yeah. just like, oh, we're so happy for you. Isn't it wonderful? Are you free now? You're yeah. truly free. Yeah. And all of these comment after comment, just congratulating this person for finally making it to the place of enlightenment where they can mm. let go of the doctrine of hell. Mm. And, and the coaches and all the people are, are right there cheering everybody on yeah. and selling their books and, and. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're profiting yeah. from that too. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a section in the book where you talk about helping Christians to learn how to doubt well. I'm sure that that idea is scary for some people, especially if they were brought up in certain church and faith environments. I think it's super wise. Uh, it should never be, nobody should ever go <gasps> when a Christian says, hey, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I mean, yeah. I'm a pastor and I think in one of our uh, executive sessions, which is where once the elders meeting is basically done with, we just kind of have our accountability stuff. I told the guys, I think I'm struggling with some doubt about something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and nobody should be aghast at that. Right. Doubt is something that uh, if, if a Christian tells me they've never doubted any aspect of their faith, I think now we have a sincerity problem. Yeah. Right? You, I don't think you're being honest with me. It reminds me of like in counseling, you tell, especially in premarital counseling, you don't tell people you're not going to fight when you get married. If you yeah. tell them that, right, you're setting them up for, yeah, dis disillusionment and yeah. disappointment. What you really do is you say, listen, you're a sinner, she's a sinner, he's a sinner, whatever. Uh, marriage is hard. You're in a fallen world. God's going to be sanctifying you. And some of that's going to come through fighting. So what you really have to do is you have to learn how to fight well. Yeah. Right. Fight like Christians. Yeah. And that's that's essentially what you're saying about doubting. Yeah. Uh, so how do we learn to doubt well? Yeah, I think doubting well involves ke keeping God involved in prayer all okay. the time. I remember meeting with a, a woman who was in deconstruction and she wanted to meet with me, which kind of surprised me because usually I'm kind of anathema in that world. But yeah, um, but she was going through all of all of the things she was doubting. She had this list and God behaved this way or that way in scripture. And I said, well, tell me about your Bible reading. She goes, oh, I don't read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And and I pointed out to her, I said, I don't think your doubt is intellectual. It's emotional. And she blew her mind because she thought that her doubt was just intellectual. Yeah. And I said, how can you be doubting something you're not even engaging with? <coughs> yeah. and, and it was an emotional block that she had. So I think doubting did well- Did that help her? Um, I think it did. Great. And, and she was like, I wonder if I have trust issues. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> yeah. it seemed to me by the end of the conversation, I'm like, I think yeah. maybe a counselor, you know, like a biblical counselor might help you better than yeah. an apologetics yeah. book. But I think doubting well is important. Um, and it's important to realize that doubt and faith are not opposites. Yeah. They're not contradictory to one another. You only doubt something you believe. It, it kind of bubbles up in the context. That's right. Yeah. And it's and it's not wrong to say, ooh, I don't know. What do I think I, yeah. I need to know? But always be involving the Lord in the process, stay in the word mm -hmm. um, and wrestle it out. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And we, we learned that from Romans 1 when, when Paul lays it out and he says, you know, unbelief is the sin basically mm -hmm. because all are without excuse. We yeah. have access to information about God just from his, the heavens declare all that. And, and so we are without excuse. So it's unbelief that's the sin. It's knowingly rejecting what you do already know. Yeah, that's right. And so that's the sin, not necessarily doubt as we're talking about it in this context yeah. where you're questioning and yeah. wanting to know, make sure that what you believe is true. Yeah. Doubt is not good. Right, you but, want to resolve your doubt. Yeah, that's right. You don't yeah. want to elevate doubt as this, and that's what happens too yeah. in the deacons and progressive Christianity is yeah. doubt becomes this ideal. Mm. No, you want to try to resolve your doubt. That's yeah. the point. That's Yeah. But definitely walk through it and don't push it down. Yeah. Wow, that's really helpful. Uh, we're almost done. You're doing great. You say, uh, I, I put it on Facebook, but I didn't put it in my notes. Isn't that funny? Uh, you talk about people wanting 
freedom from obedience, but the mm. Bible offers us freedom with within obedience. I thought about two things in relation to that. The first is the regulative principle, which people misunderstand. They think, you know, I, I won't get into all the wrong things that they that they think, but the regulative principle basically just says God tells us how we should worship, right? He sets the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And people go, that's so limiting. Well, it's only limiting if you think that there's no freedom within the boundaries that God prescribes, right? It also, I'm, I'm just working through Exodus 4 in prep for our Sunday sermon. And uh, the Lord gives Moses this message to deliver to Pharaoh. And he says, let my people go into the desert that they may serve me, mm. right? Not being a servant is not an option. Servant right. of Pharaoh, yeah. servant of Yahweh. Yeah. Either way, you're going to be a servant. Paul picks up on, on this later in the book of Romans, slave to sin, yeah. slave to righteousness, That's right? right? Uh, you you can try to find freedom by walking away from the gospel because you think that the gospel is bondage. But I promise you, mm. what you find in the world is going to be a more severe bondage than anything you could ever imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Riff on that. Take it away. Yeah, I remember back when God was rebuilding my faith, I was auditing seminary classes, just whatever I could get my hands on. I remember yeah. taking this soteriology class at Dallas, from Dallas Theological yeah. Seminary. The Doctrine of Salvation. I believe yeah. it was that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Just, make, just Some of our people may not know what soteriology means. Oh, right. Means. Yes. I think Ethan thinks that that's what the animals who only eat at dusk and dawn, <laughs> they're soteriological. Okay. They, uh, they are. Yes, <laughs> they are that too. Um, but I remember the, the professor saying something that always stuck with me. He said, when you become a Christian, yeah. you are... You're not free. Yeah, right. You you're free from sin. Amen. But you're a slave to God now. Yeah. You're not just free to yeah. you know because he was talking about how so many Christians talk about oh freedom freedom yeah. but he's like I don't think you know it's like the Princess Bride like I don't think that word, <laughs> word means, means what, do think? what do you think it means yeah the only so, good part of that movie yeah <laughs> that's right just like revenge yeah. is glorified but um, yeah so I mean that always stuck with me about that concept of freedom because yeah. in the deconstruction space you see this concept of freedom big yeah. time in fact there I think we quote this in the book too there's a, an apologist who's daughter uh, deconstructed and left the faith. And she oh. talks about freedom, the freedom of it. And um, I think she even said, freedom is my religion now. And that's what was expressed in that comment thread I described earlier mm -hmm. about hell. It's like, it's, it's felt freeing yeah. to give up the doctrine of hell, just like it would feel free. You know, I, I would feel greatly freed to embrace the idea that I can just eat a box of Krispy Kremes every meal yeah. and be perfectly healthy. Like yeah. I would feel that would be a great yeah. freedom, yeah. you know, to if I believe that. But you can't be free if you divorce from truth. Yeah. And that, so that'll put you in a different kind of bondage called diabetes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's to your point. Yeah. You know, you're free from the bondage of sin when you get saved, but you're a slave to to Christ. Yeah. But if you if you you know if you leave that and you think you're free, you're going to be in bondage to sin. Amen. Let's talk about the local church. Uh, this kind of gets back to the the two different worlds: the online world and the church. You say that in the deconstruction communities that we find online, the instinct of deconstructors is to disconnect from their church communities. Uh, and I just thought, man, this is just sin. Right. Like yeah. whenever I, I know providentially, sometimes there are reasons why members aren't at church. Uh, often there are providentially reasons why, but whenever I'm concerned for someone that they're in a pattern of sin, I'm doubly concerned when they stop showing up on Sunday mornings, mm -hmm. right? When they start disconnecting, when it's like, Hey, where's so-and-so? Oh, haven't seen them for a while. Have they been in small groups? Yeah. You know, what about their accountability partner? And they, they're just slowly pulling away from the church community, but going back to this, it can't, you can't really, you're going to serve someone. You also aren't going to disappear from the church into the ether, right? Right. When you move out of one community, because you're a human being, God himself is three persons. He's a community. Yeah. When you move out of one community, you're going to find another community. Yeah. Uh, but most of the deconstruction community that people are finding is the online community. It is. Yeah. yeah so elaborate on that. Yeah. I think social media plays a huge role in all of this. In fact, yeah. I would venture to say without social media, you don't have this phenomenon right mm. now. Now people have always left the faith. Yeah, don't get me right. wrong. Of course you always, and you might have an occasional somebody like a Bertrand Russell who writes a book and you know, that kind of thing that would happen throughout history. But with the rise of social media, it has created an environment where people don't really have a cost 
mm. in leaving. You know, it might have been before somebody would really count the cost of leaving their church community because they have nowhere really to go yeah. to to get that. But they can go find it online and they can be affirmed and celebrated and coached and they can have all of the infrastructure that they had in their church, but they just, it moves to the online space. And yeah. I mean, there are some, I don't know if they're still doing it, but the liturgists were having 24 uh, seven rooms where like online rooms where you could go and deconstruct and talk with people 24 mm. seven. So, I mean, the community that they've created online is really massive. I, I tell parents as well, cause I, I have some parents who have teenagers who are deconstructing. And I always say, I guarantee you, it's because they have access to social media. Because mm. if if you do a social media blackout with your teenager, this goes away. Yeah. And, and at least you can catch your breath, address what they've heard, work through some of the stuff. But this does not exist without social media. Yeah. At least the way it looks today. Yeah, that's right. This is one of the ongoing conversations that Christians are, uh, it's interesting, the the secular world is really beginning to understand this. Uh, have you read The Coddling of the Ameri American Mind? Uh, half of it. I haven't okay. finished it, yeah. So good. Yeah. One of the authors has, Jonathan Haidt, has yeah. done H-A-I-D-T, has uh, come out with a lot of literature recently on the negative impact of social media, particularly on teenage girls. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, it's it's so weird when you see like these tech gurus and these secular psychologists saying like, keep your kids away from this and we don't allow it in our home. And then you turn around and you see Christians who should be more discerning, who should be more aware. Just, you know, there's little Johnny, 12 year old Johnny on Tumblr all day. Yeah. Well, 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 of course, Johnny's going to deconstruct. What right. do you think was going to happen? Right. It's, yeah. And there's no way that, did you say Tommy or Johnny? Johnny, <laughs> Johnny, Tommy, whatever. There's no way that Johnny is getting that much discipleship as, as much time as he's spending right, on right. And, and there. And I don't know what, yeah. what we think is going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not to turn this into a public school versus homeschool versus private school debate, but <clears throat> when uh, we had, we live in like one of the best cities in America and the school that we put our daughters in, in kindergarten, the first sentence that their teacher taught them was, I love God, right? So like, if you're going to put your kids in public school, it's one yeah. of the best ones that you could do it, uh, where, where you could put them in. But maybe around the third grade, we decided to pull them out. Uh, really, we were just thinking more about like peer influence. Mm. Eight hours a day, they were just spending around their peers and how like throughout all of human history, that was not the most normal thing that children experienced, right? right? The, the majority of their waking hours were spent around older siblings or family members or parents. And, and that was a significant influence. And that doesn't mean they didn't have playtime with mm -hmm. people of their own age group, but they did. And something really interesting happened. Our kids were not wild off the chain. They were very young, but we noticed an immediate increase in like their sweetness mm. and their obedience. Yeah, even just the way that they communicated with us and with others, it, it improved, Wow, you know? And so I do think that like who, your children, who are they spending most of their time with? Who are they being most influenced by? Is a really big uh, question that parents should be considering. That that actually ministers to me because oh, we praise God. yeah because we we've done all three <clears throat> we yeah. um, did public we did private and for the last two years we've homeschooled yeah and I've worried like I, like I'm the only people there we're the only people there around all day yeah so I, I guess that's a good thing yeah I think it's really <laughs> good and I mean you guys are part of a church right oh yeah 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 I think the whole like not to turn this into a homeschooling podcast but the whole like they're not going to be socialized first of all. Let's set aside that term. Uh, I think weird kids <laughs> come from weird families. You know what I'm saying? Like <clears throat> my kids are homeschooled and they are a blast. And I think it's because I'm totally rad. No. But, yeah, of course. But like we're, I think we're a pretty normal family. We're not, so, we are weird, but in not, not in that way. We're not socially <laughs> awkward. And our church is like a really healthy community. Yeah. Right. And so they're spending most of their time around us and around in the church and that has shaped their personality and they're not the weird homeschool kids that can't look at someone in the eye. Yeah. And I think that's, that, um, stereotype is, is not really true anymore. Yeah. It may be in the eighties when they're, you know, there's so many co-ops and things now, but, that's also true. um, but even in the eighties and nineties, I used to coach softball <clears> and stuff <throat> and like my sweetest, most normal kids were the homeschool kids. So oh, yeah. I, I wonder Great. if some of that's just a bit of a stereotype. Yeah, anyway. I think yeah. so. I, I know some people who homeschool and, uh, 
their kids are like, I'm when I'm in the same room with them, I'm like, you're weird. <laughs> but that's because their parents are weird. Now, if you're wondering who it is, I'll tell you. It's no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, I thought you guys ended the book on a really good note. You ended on the note of hope. Yeah. Uh, you say it might take weeks, months, or even years for the deconstructing person to come to a place where they're ready to hear your point of view. But even when you say that, you're letting us know that it is possible in the same way that it's possible for someone who's been excommunicated from a church to repent and be yeah. restored to fellowship in the same way that someone who fell away due to different non-deconstructing reasons can come back to the faith, right? Re repentance is always on offer. It's always available, mm -hmm. uh, which leads me to ask you, as you've been, uh, as you've been dealing with this subject matter and you've been in these communities to some extent, and you've been having these conversations, have you seen anyone come back? Not many. Okay. So I, I've seen there are a couple that mm -hmm. I've interviewed on my podcast who one had uh, actually both had deconstructed into progressive Christianity. Yeah. One was discipled by a local pastor back into historic faith. And Praise God. yeah, so that was a great story. And then um, another one as well, but I don't, I haven't seen a lot of that yet. Yeah. Um, because I think st it's still fairly new yeah. as far as the explosion of it is. It's still kind of exploding yeah. and it's attractive. We're on the to, front end of the We're wave. on the front yeah. end of it. The, yeah. the freedom of eating the Krispy Kremes all day is still, <laughs> they're still high on that You feeling. don't feel sick yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but it's, it's, it's really my prayer and my hope. And it's not like, and this is what I tell people too. It's not like God is up there going, oh my gosh. Everybody's right. leaving. What's going oh, on? No. What are we going to do? Yeah. No, I mean, God's got this. Yeah. And and like I said, I suspect that he's letting people yeah. taste the darkness. And maybe people who grew up in church <clears throat> who might have otherwise not known. Right, right. It's a mercy. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Earlier when, when, when you were talking about how like in previous times, maybe this couldn't have happened without social media, I did wonder... In, in the doctrine of concurrence, you know, bad things happening, but God using them for his own mm -hmm. good sovereign purposes. Uh, is there a sense in which this is really good for the church? Oh, I think it is. Yeah. Oh, I think it is. Yeah, especially yes. in the Christian South, right? Because you it's think shaking about, everybody uh, up. You got, yeah. you listen, every housewife, every, you know, every businessman, every single Christian now. Yeah. yeah has to have these conversations because they have somebody in their life who's going on social media saying yeah. that the Bible's been corrupted and all these, yeah. and it's it's forcing us to wake up. It's mm. forcing us to um, study to show yourself approved. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 God's mercy yeah. because it, there, the line, anytime the lines get very clear, yeah. it's good. Yeah. You know, the gray, yeah. every can float around in the gray. Yeah. But when the lines get clear, you know, growing, growing up in California. What uh, part? LA. Okay. I was born in Northridge. Oh yeah. Stop. Stop. I lived in San Diego and back and forth North Hollywood. I lived in Northridge from that. the time I was a year old until I was 12 when we moved to Chatsworth. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. So yeah. look at that. Okay. Um, yeah. So going get, and so you probably experienced some of this too. It's like, if you're a Christian, you really had to be a Christian. Uh, it, like it yeah. wasn't cultural. I remember moving to Nashville and going to the YMCA and everybody's reading left behind books <laughs> on the exercise bikes. I'm like, you're reading that in public? Like, and so. <laughs> and then they left the books behind. Yeah. Right. On exactly. the bikes. Oh, Oh, good. See, I got that one immediately. Nailed it. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, when when the lines are clear, it 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 strengthens the church. I think. Hey, Amen, sister. Yeah. Uh, we have a lightning round to end on. You're not going to get this on some other interview. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite candy? Do you have one? Do I have time to think about the yeah, answers? I know it's lightning, so there's through, pressure. Yeah. My favorite candy. Snickers, Reese's. Yes, yes. I I like the all the candy. Probably um, the one I go, I, I eat the most okay. is like a s dark chocolate with salt. You know, the salted oh, yeah. dark chocolate. You know, at Panera, which we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. they do that kitchen sink cookie. Have you had oh, that? Oh, no, I haven't. And they put salt All on it. It's like caramel chocolate with oh. like sea salt on top. Oh. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, least favorite candy? Mars bars. <laughs> that was fast. It's really a pointless. They should stop making them immediately. <laughs> I think they do. It doesn't do they have still nuts them? in it. It's yeah. like it's like a Snicker bars, like ugly little younger oh, cousin wow. or something. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's not even that it's bad. It's just that it it's just really nothing. I would rather have nothing. Yeah. <laughs> than <a> Mars bar. <laughs> Can you eat black licorice? 
I love black licorice. Uh, okay. Yeah. Ugh. I love it. Black licorice. If, if I even smell black licorice. Really? I, we spent too much time on this podcast, which is supposed to be about exploring complex <laughs> biblical <laughs> ideas. We spent way too much time talking about how much I hate black licorice. Oh, oh wow. yeah. But that means you like root beer. I do like root there beer. There you go. Yeah. Um, favorite hymn? Um, Come Thou Fount. <sighs> yeah. Prone to Wander, Lord, I mm -hmm. feel it. In totally fact, in, in my music that I talked about, yeah. I wrote a song called Prone to Wander okay. where I sing the chorus of that at the end. Oh, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, least favorite hymn or one that you think like, we got to cut this one out. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a hymn. Songs that you hear people sing in Christian churches, probably just oh. any Hillsong song. <laughs> <laughs> um well, I mean, do the progressive rewrites of sure. the hymns count? Yeah. All the progressive rewrites where they take Wretch out of Amazing Grace <laughs> yeah. and they take, you know, yeah. this is my story. What is your yeah. story? What yeah. is your song? You know, yeah. when they change the lyrics to. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, I think my least favorite one has to be whatever songs. So I, my first experience in a youth group was when I moved to Alabama from California, which, you know, very secular. I'd never darken the door of a church. Yeah, I come here as a teenager and they're like, you should come to youth group. And I'm like, what's that? And we go to some, there's like a garage and the lights are off and, you know, there's a stage and they're singing this really bad music. And the pastor gets up there and says, you know, no having sex. <laughs> I went home and I told my mom about it and she was like, they did what? The <laughs> lights were off? Did anybody touch you? You know, like... <laughs> She just didn't have a frame of reference okay? for that. Are you okay? <laughs> uh, but uh, I think I still, in my mind, I'm still like, there are still open wounds from some of that music we used to see. You oh, know, wow. It's a big, big house yeah. with lots and lots of room. I know that that's a good song biblically, but I just can't get it out of my head. Well, you know what? I, I could pick a, gr a genre okay. that I really wish they would stop okay. today. Yeah. And that's, I mean, obviously any songs are, I don't like to sing about myself. I want to sing about God when I'm worshiping, yeah. but it's the specific genre of how I feel when yeah. I'm worshiping. Yeah. Like I feel it and no offense to Chris Tomlin, but I feel alive. <laughs> I am alive on yeah. God's great dance floor. I don't know what to do while they're singing that song because yeah. it's like, I actually don't feel that way right now. So now <laughs> I feel like I'm lying and now I'm being forced to lie in worship. I think I should just not yeah. sing it. And I have this like existential debate in yeah, my head yeah, about yeah. like I don't actually feel the way I say that I'm feeling yeah. if I sing the lyrics my feelings fluctuate but God's nature and character that's and right. works don't so let's just focus let's on just that focus on yeah, that. yeah. That's, that's good <laughs> um what are you reading right now Right now, I have uh, just I've just finished a couple of books. I'm and I just put three on my Kindle that I'm going to get started with, but I'm always reading a bunch. So okay. I actually am in the middle of. Well, I mentioned I'm I'm halfway through Coddling of the American Mind. I am about halfway through of Cormac McCarthy's newest novel, which is The He's Passenger. Dead. No, he just he, didn't he die. No, is this the Mandela effect? Oh man, do you no, know the man? Mandela effect is? I don't think so. It's this thing that uh, we won't get into it, but basically okay. a lot of people thought that Mandela died in oh. the eighties. Oh yeah. You know? Okay. Maybe so it I is. thought no. Cormac McCarthy First died. First novel in okay. 16 years. It's called The Passenger. It's very weird. Okay. It's not grabbing me like, like, uh, the road I couldn't did. even do Blood Meridian. Well that, yeah, I try. I, yeah. I got about a fourth of the way through Blood Meridian. Okay. It's just, you know, you get to the baby bush tree <laughs> and you're like, I yeah. don't need, that's why I liked the road of his. Cause I do feel like there's a redemption yeah. in that. It, yeah. it has more of a redemptive um, undertone. Yeah. Um, but gosh, on the spot, what am I reading? Because I'm always reading like four yeah. or five things. Well, okay. Um, rather than answering that, you oh, are- I'm, I'm right okay. in the middle of a book, Jesus Before Constantine, which is really an interesting look at uh, just it's more historical of, of the church. Right the early church? To, to Constantine. Who's it by? Oh, if I had my Kindle, you could bring me yeah. my phone. I could so you're a Kindle reader? I am a Kindle yeah. reader and I'm an Audible listener. I love I, I take in a lot of content through Audible. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I So I put out a, a reading list at the end of every year, kind of the books that I've done for the year. And I, I say a lot of these are physical, but a lot of them are audio. Uh, Kindle is for when I travel. It's just mm. so easy to take on a plane. Yeah. I like it for research because you can highlight and yes. all your highlights are right there. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, people say Audible doesn't count. And I'm like, I, I get what you mean by that. Yeah. But if, if by reading, you're just talking about taking time to focus and acquire this information using your senses, sometimes it's the sense of sight, sometimes yeah. it's the sense of sound. It's basically the same thing. Right. Yeah. And if you don't pay attention which I know some people don't very okay. well, 
you're, it's just like, you can do the same thing with reading. Have you ever like gotten oh, sure. to the bottom of a page and oh. realized you didn't In fact, I tend, <laughs> get anything? I tend to do that more with physical reading than listening. Yes. So I think, yeah, I had to let go of that yeah. a little bit because I used to feel that way. Like, well, it doesn't really count if I listen to it on Audible. And then I had to ask myself, well, what is my goal? Do right. I want this information in my head? Right. Well, I don't care how it gets in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, or do I just care about having read yeah, a physical Yeah, to be book. able to say I yeah. did this, you know. So yeah, I, um, oh, I just finished like as of a day or two ago, J. Warner Wallace's next book okay. called The Truth and True Crime. It's not out yet, okay. but I'm going to be writing the foreword. And it's oh. it's a very cool book where he tells all these stories from when he was a detective, okay. but he connects theological points to them. Like he has a whole chapter on- uh, Is that know, the original. guy who wrote Cold Case Christianity? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's gotcha. like a whole chapter on original sin and what's wrong with the world. And, and, and just, it was really cool how he tied that all into his detective stories. Yeah. So I just finished that one. Um, that makes me think of a book I just read from a guy at DTS. You took some classes at DTS? I, well, I audited. You audited? Yeah. Well, I'd, actually, I want to be careful the way I say it. DTS offered classes on iTunes U where you yeah, could listen to the right. lectures. Yeah. That's what I did. Okay. I didn't actually officially audit. Gotcha. There. Yeah. There's a guy there, a professor, who has a book called AI Theist. Mm. And he it's basically like um, in the form of a novel. He, it's an apologetics book in the form of a novel oh. interacting with AI. Oh, wow. And I don't want to give the whole book away, but I'll tell you this. It, first of all, I was surprised at how good it was. Somebody recommended it and I was like, I don't really want to read. It's, it's kind of like I got my own long list of books. Yeah. This doesn't really sound like it's up my alley. A Christian guy who's writing a novel that's really in apologetics. There's no way this isn't going to be terrible. Yeah. It was fantastic. Oh, cool. And the AI basically finds his way to the Christian worldview. Think about oh. AI, right? He has access to all the oh, world's yeah. information. information. And he, it's self-learning and you work your way through all these logical propositions and eventually he gets... Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I'll have to check that out. Okay. Uh, do you reread books? I have, but it's not my habit. Okay. I have reread a few different books, um, yeah. but it's not typically... What, what is your favorite book? Let's start with fiction mm -hmm. and then do nonfiction. You can have that be theological or not. Okay. So favorite fiction is probably The Road, Carmen, yeah, Carmen so McCarthy. Yeah. Um, I really also liked The Hobbit. Let's go. I don't like Lord of the Rings. I don't like Lord of the Rings. Let's oh my gosh. Go. Yes. Yeah. Right? No, Luke loves Lord of the Rings, I, but The Hobbit. The Hobbit was great. So good. The Hobbit was like what Lord of the Rings should have been. I know this I is like agree. unpopular opinion, but no way. I've never made it through Lord of the Rings all the way because it's yeah. just like they're walking around this place and they're like, the I don't trees even know what are, the places are anymore. The yeah, movies so. are terrible. No, I, have you I like the movies. Oh, okay. Have you watched The Hobbit? I can't bring myself to watch The Hobbit movies. I have, yes. Okay. Did you like them? Um, well, okay. So. I watched the movies before I read the book. Oh, uh, okay. So that can change that. You know, I did yeah, enjoy the movies, but okay. they're very different from the books. Like there's characters yeah. in the movies that aren't even in the books. Okay. okay. Uh, in the book. But um, I really enjoyed that book a lot. I just I thought- believe. Have it, you done it on Audible? Uh, no, that one I actually read physically. Okay. Uh, what's the guy's name? Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis, the guy who plays <gasps> oh, Gollum. Gollum. He narrates it. Oh, nice. I don't know what kind of awards they have for audio yeah. book stuff. <laughs> Which, by the way, like for those who are thinking about getting into audiobooks, the narrator really matters. It matters. That's it matters why I read all my own books that, that I've written wow. because I yeah. like when authors read their books, yeah. their own books. Uh, Andy Serkis. So I want to actually do it with my kids. It was such an experience, yeah. such an immersive experience. I would like pull up somewhere and I would be listening and I like, I got to go in for this meeting, but I could like not turn it off. It yeah. was so good. Yeah. So check it out okay. on Audible. And one yeah. more fiction, if yeah. I can. So three, of course, yeah. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is one yeah. of my written favorites. by, uh, isn't it? Well, I'm going to get the Bronte. It's I'm going to get the sister <laughs> as is Charlotte, right? Bronte. Uh, you know, I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, Emily and Charlotte, right? Yeah. I don't know who did it's, what? It's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> if it's Victorian lady literature, I struggle with it. <laughs> 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 um, okay, and uh, so that was fiction. What about nonfiction? Um, nonfiction, of course, the Bible, but that's a given. But um, Augustine's Confessions ah. is my probably second favorite book next to the Bible. Okay. Um, and, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think, it's so hard to think of these on the spot, yeah. like books that have just really helped me so much. Um, I, I, I loved a book called the, the heresy of orthodoxy by Michael I, Kruger. Yeah. I, I actually, that's one of the ones I reread. Okay. And I read cold case Christianity, the one that we mentioned yeah. before yeah. three times. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you probably needed to. I needed yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, we have a couple in our church who the who, they're about to join the sister, the wife, sister to me, that is. Uh, although we are in Alabama, so you never know. <laughs> uh, she got saved reading Cold Creek Case Christianity. Yeah. Um, you Do you have plans for another book? Any, I am contracted okay. for another book. About, but I don't, don't know. know. See, this yeah. is one of the, uh, <laughs> this is one of the things that can happen. You you you're a good writer, a good thinker. Your books sell, and then you get into this loop yeah. where like you start feeling pressure to like do the next thing before the yeah. the first thing even sells, or for you the second thing yeah. uh, even settles. And it's it's kind of like that in the music industry, right? Yeah, like it is. You have the next album contracted, yeah. and it's like I don't know that you can really create. Right. Some people can. Well, I uh, told them that I would sign for that additional book okay. if they wouldn't bug me for two years. Nice. So Very I, wise. I am, I've pretty much determined in my mind, I'm not okay. going to write something unless it's really something yeah. that is like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, guilty pleasures, TV shows, any, like, oh, like I was just, watching Jersey I just Shore. Thought, <laughs> no, <laughs> I just thought of a guilty pleasure the other day. What was it? Um, well, I, I love zo anything zombie. Oh, really? Yeah. What's your go-to zombie movie? Um, there, there was a really good zombie movie called the girl with all the gifts that I oh, really liked. I've never heard of it. Um, cargo was another really good one. Okay. Um, I just, I, there's something about that genre yeah. that just makes me ponder all the moral questions. Oh, yeah. So it's intellectually stimulating. Oh, very much. Okay. Yeah. You know, like Korean cinema has a lot yeah. of like They've, zombie They had stuff. a series that I watched. Uh, I watched yeah. on Netflix that was really interesting. Their their mythology was a little different, where the zombies like sleep during the day. Oh. And then they wake up at night. But I think I Am Legend is one of the best zombie movies. Oh, I I enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah. That was really good. I like that too. Uh. Okay. How about let's close on this note. Give us a good Zoe girl story for 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 those who. You know, okay. Um, who are fangirling a, or fanboy? What's fan a good boy. Zoe girl story? Well, I mean, there there were so many times when just embarrassing moments happen where your flies down on stage <laughs> or you yeah. trip and you know fall down. So we had plenty of that stuff happen. Um, oh, that's oh. the one. That's the one. I'm so glad you're Thanks, here. Mike. Yeah. So glad you're here. So okay, yeah, this is a great story. So we are at a festival. And it's our time for sound check. And okay. we go up on the stage and we're like, I was tired. You know, yeah. we've been on the road for a while. And there's these old guys up on the stage playing journey songs. And I was like, you know, when is, are we going to do a sound check? I'm asking <laughs> yeah. our road manager. And he's like, all of a sudden he's like, ladies, exit the stage right now. Leave the stage, leave right now. And I'm like, but we have to do our sound check so yeah. I can go rest. And he's like, get off the stage like that. Uh. So we go off and he goes, that's journey. And we're like, excuse me, what, like the actual band Journey? He's like, yes, that is Journey. So Journey was on the main stage. I don't even know who Journey, Journey. is. Journey! So now I come to you with open arms. Oh, come on. You're you too no young idea. for Journey? Oh my gosh. Let this be a lesson to the youth, Let how fleeting the fame be. of this that world is. is. I have no idea. And they're like oh, a really big deal. You got to jam out on some Journey songs on the way home. Okay, all right. But so it was Journey. And so we were on a little, the Christian side stage, right? So, yeah. so we were kind of embarrassed, like, oh my gosh, we just literally walked up on stage in the middle of their sound check. Well, when we did our our concert, yeah. we always did like a gospel presentation and you know an invitation. Praise and God. so when and I I'm sure I you know we didn't do a great job at it, but <laughs> right. I yeah. didn't I just did my best. Yeah. But yeah. I remember giving the thing and the journey stage was so loud that whenever they were playing a song, like you could hear it clear as day where we were. Uh -huh. And so because I was talking, right when I'm like giving the gospel yeah. presentation, they start playing open arms, yeah. which you'll have to listen to now. Okay. And you can imagine the, the, the nineties moment of the universe when wow. they're singing open arms as people are coming forward. Doing for the the offering. <laughs> That's a pretty good note to end on. And I will look up journey and I'll probably be disappointed. Right. What's the one know. song I should listen to? Don't stop believing. Oh, that's journey. Or okay. See, yeah. hi, uh, highway run. What, hi, what's, uh, Highway run, the midnight sun. Yeah. All right. Well, I we guess all need the clouds to make us laugh. Y'all can do like a journey cover band, I guess. <laughs> uh, Elisa nailed it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't fully agree with every person 
and everything that they write uh, when it comes to guests on this podcast, but this book was phenomenal. Thank you. I hope that every single person watching or listening buys a copy. Listen to me. Even if you aren't deconstructing or there's not someone in your immediate family, you will probably need to use this resource at some point in time in the future. Yeah. If you're a pastor and you're listening to this, buy copies, put them in your book stall, give them away at your congregational meetings. If you're a youth pastor, just get a get a bunch of these and like do a study with them. If you're a small group leader, use these. If you're a Sunday school leader, use these. Have a have a, an extra copy of this on hand to give away because I bet you will use it one day. Uh, sister, thank you so much for being on our show and I can't wait to see what the Lord does with this book. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Let me pray. Lord, we pray that you will bless Elisa's ministry. Um, Lord, thank you for keeping her. Prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Uh, but you keep us by your sovereign power, by your grace, the same grace that saved us, protects us, and leads us all the way home. Lord, we pray that we will not look back on this episode in the years to come and, and look back on it as those who have deconstructed, those who have walked away from the faith. We pray that you will continue to keep us, Lord. Help us to, to handle our doubts well, to bring, to bring them into the light, to wrestle with you in your word and in prayer. Um, and we pray that this book uh, will be a blessing to your church, Lord. Uh, we know that all that you have called before the foundations of the world will, will surely come to you. You've predestined the world towards that end, and your Holy Spirit is at work infallibly bringing those purposes to pass. And so we praise you, God, even for the tragedy of many deconstructions, because even those you are using for the glory of your name, you are revealing who are the sheep and who are the goats. Lord, we even recognize the fact that there are many in the church who will not deconstruct, who nevertheless do not belong to you. So we pray for pastors all over the country this weekend, all over the world, that they will just be faithful and preach the gospel and, and just entrust the results to you. We pray all this uh, to the glory of your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.